Well, good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. I would ask everyone to turn any devices they have, electrical devices, to silent so they don't interfere with the proceedings. Uh, apologies have been received from committee members Richard Leonard and Jackie Bailey. The, the first issue is item one on the agenda. Does the committee agree to take items three and four in private? Yes. Thank you. Uh, for our first panel of witnesses this morning in our economic data inquiry, we have, um, in no particular order, Rebecca Riley, who is Director of the Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence. Uh, welcome. Uh, Martin Wheel of the Royal Statistical Society and Professor Campbell Leith of the Royal Economic Society. So welcome to all three of our witnesses today. Um, I wonder if I might start with a fairly general question to our witnesses, which is if they might give a brief synopsis of their take on the current provision of economic statistics in Scotland, what their views are on the statistics and data that we have available uh, and its nature. Perhaps start uh, to my left with Martin Wheel. Well, my sense is that you know, the availability of data in Scotland, the account of it was summed up quite well by something which I think was said to this committee earlier, that seen in terms of a region of a country, Scotland is very well provided relative to nation states, of course, for many practical reasons. Scotland, the provision of Scotland's in stati Scotland statistics is rather thin. So, no, is the glass half full or half empty? It really depends how you want to look at it. And of course, there are many practical reasons why the provision of the sort of uh, statistics that independent countries have create difficulties in Scotland because it is so intimately bound up with the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, my sense is that uh, there are things that uh, you know, the Scottish Government could do to improve Scottish statistics, but uh, fundamentally, of course, you get what you pay for, and it's not obvious to me that there is much that could, or I, you know, I'm not aware of things that could be done costlessly. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Riley. Uh, thank you. I mean, my, my understanding uh, echoes uh, what Martin Wheel just uh, said, that um, if you look at Scotland as a country within the UK or a region within the UK, I believe that the statistics are uh, relatively good, um, but that obviously uh, there are statistics that you would have for a nation state which are uh, more difficult to compile for Scotland. Uh, at the same time, I also understand that there are um, key uh, economic data that are perhaps uh, missing, uh, but that's related to the difficulty of, of, of providing subnational statistics. Uh, I also think that there are quite a few opportunities to develop um, uh, additional data or improve existing data, uh, and I believe some of those are in train at the moment. Thank you, and Professor Leith. Okay, well, I think officially I'm here under the wearing the hat of the Royal Economic Society, but I think they asked me to do it because of my previous experience acting as a commissioner for the Scottish Fiscal Commission for the last, last three years, so I've been quite a, a heavy user of, of Scottish data. Uh, I think a lot of the focus has been on national accounting data and constructing GDP and its components and so on. While from the Fiscal Commission's perspective and forecasting devolved taxes, we didn't rely so much on that national accounting data. We tended to use specific data that related to the tax base associated with each individual tax. So for land and building transactions tax, we look at house price data, we look at house price transactions data, we have simple models to extrapolate these, we have more complicated models to build these up into, into a tax forecast. The, the income tax forecast starts with uh, HMRC data on the distribution of taxpayers in Scotland and scales that up with nominal wage growth forecasts. So it doesn't really use national accounting data, it uses wage data and labour market statistics, which there's quite good data for in, in Scotland. So uh, I, I think when you discuss where you need to expand data coverage and so on in Scotland, you need to think about the decisions that are being made, both on the expenditure side and 
what's happening on the revenue side, what taxes you need to forecast, and what variables you need to forecast these, these tax bases. So it's not always that national income statistics should be the main focus of, of what you expand. Uh, that said, however, there's part of the remit of the Fiscal Commission is to forecast GDP and to assess when Scottish GDP moves significantly out of line with the rest of the UK because that can trigger additional borrowing powers. So there's increasing emphasis on what happens to Scotland if it's hit with an asymmetric shock and forecasting that. And there's a macro model that's owned by the Scottish Government. I think they've just put out to tender a, a, a procurement of a new macro model. So there's interest in building these models to try and analyse this adjustment process. And within that, there's areas of the national accounts where you might want to expand data so that you're, you're more, we have more knowledge of the adjustment process when Scotland gets hit with a shock relative to the rest of the UK. So if the UK gets hit with a shock, monetary policy adjusts, fiscal policy adjusts, if Scotland only gets hit by a shock, there's no monetary policy to adjust. Fiscal policy is essentially a balanced budget. There's quite limited uh, borrowing powers. So Scottish wages, Scottish prices have to adjust. Scotland has to regain competitiveness relative to the rest of the UK, relative to the rest of the world, to, to come out of that shock. And we don't really have the data on prices and so on to, to model that adjustment process. We don't know how long it would take, how painful it would be, and that, that's the area where more, more kind of statistics could be used, I think, in terms of macro policy. Thank you. And um, perhaps developing that further, John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, yes, I think my question is really along the lines of what is happening either in the UK or internationally as far as changes in uh, the gathering of statistics and so on uh, is concerned. Are there things changing at a UK level that will impact on us for example, is the ONS going to be collecting more regional data in future? But, but anything around that that you can tell us about would be helpful. Uh, could, sorry, could, 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 could I say something on that? I'm, although I'm sure it'll hardly be the whole of the picture. The ONS, you know, in, I mean, this is something that they, you know, in some sense, comes in cycles. There are periods when they are keen to make more use of administrative data. I've also seen other periods where they've worried that administrative data don't answer quite the right questions, and uh, they've started to think they've had difficulty with them. But anyway, at the moment, there's a you no. Know, there's a lot of interest in making more use of administrative data, partly because, of course, of the increased computational. Uh, power that's available, and one particular area where the ONS is wanting to make, you know, of which the ONS is wanting to make your, more use of VAT returns as a high-frequency clue to what's going on in the economy. Now, Charlie Bean, in his report, argued that those could also be used as a good regional source because for most of the people putting in VAT returns, they're relatively local businesses, and you know where they are. Uh, I must say I do slightly worry about whether the issue of the sort of large firms and some of them may be putting in one VAT return for the whole of the United Kingdom and you don't know whether their sales are in Scotland or England or Wales or in Northern Ireland. So I am a bit nervous that uh, you know, this use of VAT data into... No, as a clue to what, as a guide to what's happening in Scotland and in other parts of the United Kingdom, may not yield as much as, for example, Charlie Bean's report seems to suggest. But nevertheless, that's an area where, at a national level, there is work starting on it, and uh, it is something that I'm sure the ONS will be investigating because of p part of the mandate of the ONS of course, is to improve the provision of regional data and that include no, the sort of techniques that will tell you more about what's happening in the northeast of England will also tell you more about what's happening in Scotland, provided this issue of coverage doesn't prove to be an insuperable obstacle. I mean, could I just follow up on something you said there, which was, I think, that the administrative data is a kind of cycle that sometimes it's more popular and sometimes it's less. Because last week we had a number of witnesses, and they seemed to be, I got the impression from them at least, that there was a kind of international trend to use more administrative data 
and to rely less on surveys. And that seemed to be quite convincing because surveys didn't seem to be very dependable. Would you argue more that it's just a kind of fashion at the moment and maybe no. surveys are, can be quite good? No, I'm sorry, it's more, than, it's more than a fashion. The reality is that changes in computing techniques mean that we can do things with administrative data that we couldn't do in the past. You have some statistical offices, Sweden and Norway are good examples, which rely almost entirely on administrative data because they collect data that... Uh, no, essentially public, the public won't tolerate being collected in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are some things for which surveys will always be needed. For example, if you want to measure unemployment, unemployment people who are unemployed are those who are not working and actively looking for work. And again, unless you have all sorts of monitoring of no use of uh, websites for jobs and so on. The only way whether you can find the, the only way in which you can find out whether people are actually looking for work is by asking them. But mm. there's a separate issue that sometimes you might find that administrative data don't quite answer the question you want, or no, and therefore they have to be supplemented by surveys. For example, going back to the issue of VAT returns, no, VAT may tell you about a company's total sales, but it won't necessarily tell you about which industries they're operating in. You may know a firm will be classified to an industry, but actually it may be operating in two or three, so you're likely to need surveys at the very least as a supplement. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, I think there are uh, very significant developments in uh, the use of, of admin data. Some uh, statistical offices abroad uh, do, do use uh, admin data, and I think that there are opportunities to exploit these in the UK, uh, which, which, um, well, which haven't been done so, so far. I think also this uh, program is supported by the Digital Economy Act, which will make, uh, hopefully make access to um, some of these databases easier to facilitate and also um, to, to a wider audience or a set of researchers who can investigate uh, these issues. Um, there are difficulties, as Martin suggests, with um, compiling regional statistics from the admin data. Um, they are useful for producing admin data primarily because of their very extensive coverage. So uh, surveys uh, have often I, mean, I, I realise the Scottish Government provides um, a boost to many of the surveys that are done by the ONS so that you can produce reliable Scottish economic statistics. Um, but the admin data is, is uh, in some cases, almost near a census, so you have many more uh, observations and can compile uh, relatively reliable statistics for some, uh, some types of indicators. Uh, there is, of course, though, this issue of, of apportionment. How do you split a company's activity, a company doesn't have to uh, report the activity uh, that it does in the UK, uh, or sorry, that it does in, in, in particular parts of the UK. And so you have to make some rule. Uh, if you're not going to collect that information directly, you have to make some rule about how to allocate that to the different areas within the UK. Uh, and as far, as far as I understand, um, there is a program at the, at the ONS to use admin data to develop these regional statistics where uh, different apportionment rules will be used and tested for um, whether you get different answers depending on, on, on whether you use uh, different apportionment rules. And that, that, is, that, will, that will be a weakness of these statistics, but I think still there are, are very significant benefits to, to, um, to using these data. Also, um, they can help provide uh, more timely indicators of... Um, of uh, GDP, for example, for at a sub a sub national level, um, the other the other uh, development is the use of um, perhaps I, I don't know how to how to describe this, but um, big data more broadly defined. Uh, so maybe non traditional forms of data are being increasingly used by uh, statistical offices, and might also be uh, used to develop uh, regional statistics. Um, so. These are data, for example, um, I mean, for example, within, within the uh, ESCO, uh, we have a project where we want to explore the use of uh, freight data or satellite images on, on, uh, on transport uh, to develop uh, statistics on inter-regional, uh, intra-UK trade. This is something that has already been explored uh, in the Netherlands. So I think there's also um, opportunities to, 
it's not just admin data that's um, one of the developments we see. We also see increasing use of, uh, or there's certainly opportunities to use uh, other non-standard uh, forms of data to develop um, subnational statistics. I mean, on the, on the question of that, I mean, it seems to me the obvious thing as an outsider would be, well, collect the, the VAT information, get the companies to break it down and feed it in separately, but that would require, I guess, an HMRC change. I mean, is that, do you think that's something that would just meet a lot of resistance or would it just not be possible or can you not comment on that? Uh, I don't think I'm in the best place to comment on that. Um, certainly, you wouldn't be able to uh, take that data backwards in time if you were... No, uh, sure not, yes. uh, You wouldn't be able to use that retrospectively. Um, it's possible that one could conduct uh, at um, a smaller cost uh, a survey to um, investigate for some companies the likely error by using different apportionment rules without mm -hmm. uh, rolling something out more widely. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I, I should have said, uh, if you wish to come into the discussion, please indicate by, by raising your hand. Witnesses shouldn't feel they have to answer every question, and your microphone is operated by the sound desk. So, um, last of all, on Mr. Mason's question, uh, Campbell Lee. Okay. Yeah, I think well, I, I agree with the points that have been have been made. I think the the, the apportionment issue is, is one of the big issues in trying to, well, e either apply survey or admin data to Scotland. It's just companies working across the whole of the UK may not even know what is attributable to Scotland. They may not think about their business in, in that way. So that, that's a big issue to, to be dealt with. Uh, I think in terms of admin data, there's, there's also admin data within Scotland now, now that we've started generating our own revenues from devolved taxes. So for, in the case of LBTT, for example, there was when that was introduced, the, 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 the revenues were less than anticipated in the first year. There was a big debate over whether it was the progressivity of the tax was damaging the top end of the market. Uh, there's various reasons why that might be. It could have been because of this a behavioural response, or it could be that perhaps the market in Aberdeen was suffering and so on. Uh, but when people do their LBTT returns, they, they indicate lots of bits of data. So there is data there when these returns are filed. And Revenue Scotland could, could produce that data. And that would allow us to dig deeper into is Aberdeen suffering relative to the rest of the UK in terms of generating LBTT revenues? What are the behavioural responses to tax changes within that tax system and so on? So you're suggesting that data's not coming out into the public domain? No, what, uh, what, we're, what we're getting from Revenue Scotland is kind of aggregate data broken down by tax band within LBTT, uh, but it's not, we're not getting the, the regions within Scotland broken down. So okay. what we did in our last report was we, we re-simulated the Scottish Government's model using local data for prices to kind of forecast how much revenue should be generated by Aberdeen in the area around Aberdeen, and given what was forecast for prices and what happened to house prices in Aberdeen. And that could potentially account for a significant part of the shortfall in LBTT revenues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we don't know how well that model actually works in Aberdeen unless we have the outturn data for Aberdeen. So that data's there, it's in the form, uh, but it hasn't been produced by Revenue Scotland. So, so we could, there are potentials to... Yeah, I, mean, potential. I, mean, I don't want to push this too long, but I mean, was there any reason given for not being able to produce the regional data? Uh, just resources, right. the resource cost of, of doing so. Uh, in terms of admin data for Scotland as well, the, the, the income tax forecast relies heavily on admin data. So, so the way the income tax forecast works is there's something called the public use tape, which is produced by HMRC, which kind of gives you the full tax, uh, anonymised tax returns for Scotland. And what the forecast does is it takes this distribution of tax returns, splits them up into the age groups, of the Scottish population, because you find that people, people in mid -age, middle age are earning the most, they're at the peak of their careers, they're, they're paying more higher rate tax, so a lot of the revenues are coming from this age group, and you forecast taxes by age group. Uh, however, what you find is that for the 17-18 budget forecast, the only available public use tape was using 2013-14 data. So there's quite a long lag between the generation of that admin data and the revenue that we're actually trying to forecast. Now, part of that is because self-assessment comes after the tax year. 
So it takes a while for this data to settle down. But you could have <coughs> earlier rounds of pay-as-you-earn data generated by HMRC, which would be more up-to-date and could inform the, the forecasts just prior to it being produced. So there's scope to liaise with HMRC and, and, and get your hands on that admin data in a more timely way to improve forecasting. Thanks so much. Thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Um, before I move on to my question, there was the topic of VAT returns and the use of it. Um, as somebody who completed VAT returns for the best part of 30 years, um, there was a change about 20 years ago on the VAT return where previously only asked for total turnover and then it asked for turnover within the UK and turnover out with the UK on the face of the VAT return. So um, changes can be made if there's a political will for them to be made. Um, my question was going to be, can you uh, outline the key recommendations in relation to the BEAN review? Uh, you've already touched about possible use of the uh, ad additional administrative data, but what other recommendations did they uh, make and what impact would they have in Scotland? Review. Perhaps Rebecca Riley? Um, well, one of the key uh, recommendations, I believe, or things that was picked up on was the um, timeliness of, um, of GDP data for, for Scotland. Mm. Um, and I think you, know, you produce quarterly uh, GDP mm. estimates. Um, but these are provided with a, uh, a much longer lag than for the UK uh, as a whole. Um, and I think from user engagement, that was uh, something that was uh, picked up on quite strongly. Um, and I think that we can probably, uh, certainly we'll be working to, to, to improve um, the timeliness of these indicators. So one of the uh, projects uh, within the ESCO uh, being conducted by uh, Strathclyde University and Warwick Business School is to use um, admin data uh, survey data, other indicator data more broadly, um, and possibly also that returns data to try and align more the uh, sub-national GDP uh, release, the mm. timing of the release, with the UK as a whole. Um, how that, you know, whether that will work is, I mean, this is research that's being undertaken um, and, and the objective is to try and align those release dates and there is, uh, it's being done because there is a, um, it seems that it, 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 it's a worthwhile pursuit that there is an opportunity here to, to draw those release dates uh, closer. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, is, that is the hope that we can do that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Campbell Leith. Just to just add one, one thing to that. I think part of the Bean Review has suggested that the UK Statistical Authority should perhaps produce a, a more nuanced assessment of the, of the quality of what counts as national uh, statistics. So I think at the moment they, they kind of give a seal of approval to data that's produced according to certain standards. I think the Bean reports suggest that they, they strengthen that role and give, give more of a quality assessment alongside the data. Uh, and I think that would be particularly useful for the, the economists producing the Scottish data to, to have that more new, nuanced and, and stronger assessment. Um, Martin Wheel. Um, could I now mention one other thing? Of course, uh, the Bean Review led to the Digital Economy Act, uh, the Digital Act, and uh, paragraph 81 of that makes the UKSA the conduct of you know, administrative data being used for statistical purposes. It makes them the conduct to other users, including, of course, the Scottish Government uh, you know, for the production of Scottish statistics. So that is, you know, to the extent that the powers of the Digital Act are used and they give the uh, national statistician the power to require administrative data to be made available for statistical purposes, it does mean that the Scottish Government, the Scottish statisticians will have to work through the UKSA to, you know, to the extent that they need to use the powers in the Act to obtain their data. At least that's as I understand, though, 
that, that, that was my reading of the law. Uh, I should say, um, Campbell mentioned the issue of giving a more nuanced view. Of course, for some Scottish statistics, the providers do give quite a good view of the quality of the, well, a good qualitative view of the quality of the statistics. Uh, certainly, if you look back historically at the UK national accounts, variables used to be given codes A, B, C, and D, and it was said what A, B, and C, and D meant. That You find this if you look at the book on sources and methods that was published by Rita Morris in 1968. That's rather gone away, and... Uh, I mean, Charlie, did, Charlie Bean didn't say this explicitly, but uh, no, the implication of the recommendation that Campbell just mentioned is perhaps more of a move back towards trying to be more quantitative about what you know and what you don't know. Uh, another issue that Bean raised was to, um, well, this was a part of it, of course, on quality, on uh, accuracy was uh, trying to improve the governance processes affecting statistics and no, there of course it wasn't mentioned in the Bean review but certainly what, uh, no, to an observer from outside Scotland what really does stick out is the no, five day advance notice that some users have of official statistics whereas no, even in countries where there is, where pre-release data are still made available to some people, typically it's no, only a few hours less than a day so I think Scotland there is very much an anomaly relative to almost the whole of the developed world now. You touched upon the uh, Digital Economy Act, but you know, reading some of the evidence we've got, it, it, the suggestion is that devolved administrations won't get direct access to the data. Is there any reason for that? Well, I suppose the answer is that uh, my under my what I'm inferring is that. Uh, Parliament appointed the national statistician who is the national statistician for the whole of the United Kingdom and the, well, I, I, I wouldn't say you won't get, I mean, I didn't read it as saying you won't get direct access to the data. What I read was that if Scottish statisticians want to, use, want to make use of the powers to require administrative data to be available for statistical purposes, they need to work through the UK Statistical Authority. Now, to my mind, that's very different from saying that uh, Scottish statisticians won't get direct access to the data. I'm just reading the evidence of the Royal Statistical Society. That's what they say. Well, as I, I mean, maybe it's their interpretation of the same thing, but the way I read it is that the Scottish Government will have to work through the UK Statistical Authority. OK, thanks very much. Gil Patterson. Uh, and in the paper it says here the DEA will not provide devolved administration, so that's quite straightforward. And it says, uh, but they should. So maybe the word should change that they will. So there's some compulsion, uh, a, a statutory entitlement. Because I think from the, you know, from the outset that there is this uh, a need for the Scottish Government and other devolved administrations apart from Northern Ireland to actually almost beg to get information. So if, it was, if, if this is a new act coming in, we're kind of back where we started, are we not? Uh, it, I mean, that's my view is, but I wonder what your view is. Well, I mean, a new act, it has come in. It became law just before the general election. Uh, so it, 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 it has come in. But, no, perhaps it's too early to, set, to ask whether there have been any difficulties in using the process that's described in the act. But as I say, as I read it, the conduit is the UK Statistical Authority and... Uh, perhaps that's what the authors of the RSS paper meant when they said won't have direct access. Uh, but, no, being practical, the question I would want to know is whether there have been any problems in interacting with the UK Statistical Authority to make use of the powers that are there. And since the Act became law at the beginning of June, presumably it's currently too early to say. Okay. Anybody else get an opinion on that? Whether yep. it should be statutory or... Well, it's one of these things you test it and see if it's if it's fit. But if, you, if it produces the data easily, then then it's okay. If it's if it's a struggle, then it needs to be revisited. Well, I, I don't think I don't think anyone questions the quality of the data. I don't think 
you know, haven't heard that there's... No, it is, in order to a, access, it's not as easy as to access. The yes, I, accessing it. And in Scotland, it's the quantity, I would think, is the, is the problem, that the, the, you know, the, the stats, that, you know, some of, some of it, because it's so low in number, it's meaningless. So it's these aspects of it. Um, I, I just add um, that, well, echoing some of the things that have been said, that um, it is a, a very new act, and um, it will probably take a little bit of time uh, to find out how this process is going to work. So there's a, there's a, a law has been passed, um, but there will be a process for getting these data from other departments, etc., into uh, a, a, a form that the ONS will be able to use and to work with other researchers to develop into um, national statistics. Yeah. So that, I expect, will be a, a not an immediate process. Uh, just before we move on for that, is, do, do you, could, have you uh, other views on how relevant this is going to be to Scotland and, and the benefits that, that we're hoping would uh, flow from it? Could you maybe speak about that a bit further? In, in the... Um, Insofar as the Digital Economy Act, I think, will be uh, very important for um, making access to admin data easier uh, and, and other forms of data as well. Um, you know, it is an important. It's an important development uh, for, for for national statistics broadly defined, and therefore also for Scottish economic statistics. Anybody else? Yeah, well, I already gave the, the example of the admin data that's used in income tax forecasting. I mean, if this allows the Scottish Government and Fiscal Commission to get access to that underlying admin data in a more timely manner, then, then it's to be welcomed. Good. Sorry, could I make one other point, please? Of course, no. This discussion has focused on the letter of the law and the powers of compulsion. As I understand it, a lot of the point of the Act was that no, until it was passed, pe no, holders of administrative data, like, for example, HMRC, thought they weren't allowed to release them for statistical purposes. And the mere passing of the Act and the fact that it's perfectly clear that they are allowed to release them may, of course, and I would expect it, to mean that in practice the actual powers in the Act don't have to be used. So it's not only a question of whether the conduit through the UKSA works, but whether Scottish statisticians can build the relationship with the holders of administrative statistics no, no, that's needed to create the data without making any use of the formal powers in the Act. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, just before we move on to another aspect, you mentioned the issue of pre-release of data. And I'm just wondering how the system in Scotland compares to other countries that might have a comparable setup. I mean, is there anywhere that would have a comparable setup? And the other question is, um, do these other systems have a way of an independent check on the manner in which the data is presented before it is publicly released? In, as, as I said earlier, in ter I'm not aware of other countries where there is pre-release, no, uh, where some users, uh, some people in government have five days warning of, no, of data before they're released. Uh, as I say, in the United Kingdom, it used to be shorter that no, as I, I think went completely in July. Uh, in other countries, it may be a few hours, but uh, to my knowledge, and I'm not saying it at, uh, no, I've looked at everywhere, to my knowledge, there isn't anywhere else that has anything remotely as long as Scotland has. Uh, in terms of independent release of data, <coughs> uh, I, no, the, no, one of the aims was that there should be a single website through which uh, all official data are released, the no, the gov.uk gov website, and of course Scottish data and Scottish data releases do appear on that, I assume, at the same time as they appear on the Scottish Government website. So in that sense, in terms of standardised presentation, the process is working in the way that it works for no, other, other government departments that produce data in the United Kingdom. 
Um, Sorry, you asked an additional <coughs> question about independent. I was wondering if there's any system in other countries to have an independent check on how the data is to be presented prior to its release. I would think that in other countries, as I assume is, in the, is the case in Scotland, that the data release is the responsibility of the statisticians rather than other civil servants, and to the extent that that is true, you know, the statistical service for the United Kingdom as a whole is independent. Of course, it's questionable what, independ no, what independence means for a body which is intimate, intimately wound up with the process of government. It's very different from independence of the Monetary Policy Committee, but no, I think the guarantee has to be the independence of the statistical civil servant Ra no, rather than having a separate body. And do any of the other panel members see any difficulty with the current system in terms of pre-release of data? Well, I think it's increasingly seen as good practice to, to avoid the pre-release system, so it's, it would be best to fall in line with UK practice, I think. I, I wanted to comment on... Um, a separate question with the the bean review question. I don't know if that there's an opportunity to come back to Gordon McDonald's question. Perhaps briefly both uh, <laughs> that question and mine then. I'll focus on, on uh, Gordon McDonald's question. It's just you, you asked about some of the key points coming out of the bean review, and and um, there are some which are particularly relevant to um, subnational statistics. Uh, but also just wanted to uh, mention that of course there are many recommendations. Um, for UK national statistics more broadly defined, um, which will of course also be of benefit to Scottish economic statistics. Um, one of those uh, key areas is um, the recommendation to uh, undertake uh, research into what it is we are measuring. Um, so uh, a, key, a key issue is that um, we have a changing economy uh, and our statistics need to be changing to continue to reflect accurately uh, the economy as it changes. Um, and um, one, one example of that is, for example, the um, increasing rely, reliance on, on the um, service sector. Uh, so the economy is, is made up of different sectors of activity, of course, and um, the service sector is, is a very, very broad sector, and, and probably uh, the, a lot of the uh, price indices we, we collect, uh, which enable us to um, measure real activity, uh, in the service sector are um, not as well developed as, as for some of the other sectors which were more important decades ago and, and, and perhaps less important in terms of size uh, these days. Um, so there are recommendations to improve uh, those types of statistics and I believe there are um, developments uh, in, in that area. Also to uh, try and better understand um, implications of the uh, digital economy or the increasing digital, dig digitization of, of the economy and what that means for what we measure. Uh, you know, the shift between um, what we produce in the marketplace, what we produce at home, does that matter for our interpretation of statistics as they're compiled today? Um, or should we actually be revising how we compile some of these things? Uh, again, the deflator issue there is very important for, for some, of these, um, some of these areas. And also there are, uh, there's a feeling that there in, in the digital economy um, there are factors of production that we don't uh, measure very well. So one of his recommendations is to try and explore uh, the importance of these changes for economic measurement. And um, that's, of course, not specific to regional or country level or subnational level uh, statistics, but it's, it's something that should lead to a, an improvement throughout the system. Of um, the digital economy, <coughs> we, we'd have been reading through the evidence. That there was an example given that said that if somebody uh, previously booked a holiday through a travel agent, uh, that would count towards GDP. But if they then subsequently booked it online via the internet on their own, uh, that wouldn't count, count towards GDP, and GDP of the country would actually go down because the ONS doesn't measure that. Is that correct? Um, I think uh, the GDP will typically measure um, market activity. Yeah. Um, so if, the, if activities move from the market into the home, they may, not, uh, may, they may no longer feature in, in, in GDP statistics. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, so some activities, 
uh, if, if they are uh, of particular large in size, for example, I, I don't know what the threshold would be, but uh, mm -hmm. if, if something's deemed to be uh, very important economically, um, it might uh, then feature uh, in, 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 um, in the national accounts in some way or another, or in satellite accounts. Right. Um, and I guess uh, at the moment, there's a sense that there's quite a few of these types of um, search activities or arrangement mm. type activities that have moved from the market into the home and we, we do our own um, search for all kinds of things on the internet obviously where previously we would have gone out into the marketplace. Yeah. And um, so the, the question is then you know, how, how important are those activities? You know, we don't really have a sense of the magnitude of these changes, how important they're likely to be. Um, maybe the sum of these changes is important. Um, and um, if, even if we don't change the national statistics, we would maybe want to appreciate uh, how, what, what yeah. they imply for, mm -hmm. for our interpretation of national statistics. Yeah. I think on that point, we could move on to Gillian Martin's question. Yeah, I have a very related question to what you're just talking about. I mean, is that there's a, there is a debate about what we measure, whether what we measure represents progress towards a government's economic aims or a country's uh, economic aims and whether we should actually be measuring different things in order to ascertain whether those aims have been met. Um, for example, non-market activities, you know, things that maybe there isn't a, a kind of a, a figure going into any kind of uh, HMRC or whatever, but there is actually an economic impact. Um, what alternative measures do you think there, there could be to measuring that kind of economic activity. For example, things that happen in the household that have an economic impact, like caring, for example, or the voluntary sector where work is done, but there's no money changing hands, but it's, it's having an economic impact on, on the success of the country. Uh. Could, could, I, could I make some observations on that? The ONS does do, a, I mean, it's for the whole of the United Kingdom. It, as far as I know, it doesn't specifically identify Scotland, but it does do a study which you know, looks at the way people use their time and produces as best they can you know, estimates which do value the sorts of activities that uh, you're describing. Uh, so that has been looked at. On the issue of things moving to and fro between the market sector and the non-market sector, I, mean, I suppose I'd caution us against believing this is a new phenomenon. I remember reading somewhere people used to buy their furniture ready-made and make their sandwiches themselves. Now perhaps they tend to buy sandwiches in shops and buy flat pack furniture and put it together. So these sorts of things have always been going on and in that sense the replacement of a travel agent by a web search site is, no, okay, it's, it, it's the consequence of technical progress, but it fits into a pattern that's always been there. What I would caution against thinking that measured GDP necessarily goes down because of that, because the people who used to work in the travel agents, you know, whose labour income and the profits on the travel agent were counted towards GDP, will in all probability be doing something else now, even though we don't know what it is, and that something else will be counted towards GDP. So to the extent that resources are saved because of digital developments, it doesn't necessarily mean GDP will go down. What it may mean simply is people are doing other things which we are measuring. Uh, so, so um, yes, that, that it's important to observe this, that this is not a new phenomenon. So, for example, uh, childcare uh, is, is a very big activity, actually, uh, which, which um, isn't reflected uh, as economic activity. Um, and that has been you know, changing over time. We've moved childcare increasingly out of the household um, into the market. So um, I think the key thing is to try and understand how these developments affect uh, overall output, um, and whether how you then whether you incorporate them in one way or another is is um, is, a, is a separate issue. But you'd want to understand um, how 
these changes if they're very rapid over time, for example. So we have digitization is uh, a development which has happened very quickly uh, recently. So if some of those activities are actually significant, it could affect the time profile of measured growth. Uh, and we simply just want to understand um, what, what those patterns look like. Yeah, modern economies are, are big, complex things with lots of things going on all the time, and th th there's no there's no single silver bullet policy that's going to have a big measurable effect on GDP growth. So you're not really going to capture the success or failure of the package of policies by looking at GDP growth or a, or a revised measure of GDP growth. The, the kind of policies that are pursued in advanced economies are, are, are kind of small micro policies. They're focused on subset individual groups. Uh, they're, I don't know, they're policies which introduce free school meals to all children. And you want to assess through microeconomic data whether that has an effect. Does that improve performance in schools? Does that affect behavior in schools, does mm -hmm. it? Uh, and you need this kind of very small scale micro microeconomic data. You, ideally, you want randomized control trials. So you introduce the policy in some schools, but not in others, and see what the differential impact was. And, and that's the way you do evidence-based policy. And across the board, you hope that collectively you do good policies, and this adds up to something. So that, that kind of... Um microdata that you're talking about, that is available effectively in, in a devolved nation like Scotland, that we have the mechanisms to measure that. It's just a case of yeah, coming so, back so to the very first <coughs> point about spending money on it. Yeah, so, well, uh, my family takes part in one of these data collection exercises. We're, we're one of the objects of data. The, the growing up in Scotland survey, periodically someone will come to my house and interview, test my children and their cognitive abilities, ask us questions about our income and various aspects of schooling and so on. Uh, and this will build up into a profile of microeconomic data on education in Scotland. So, so we're, we're a data point in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the kind of collection of data that allows you to evaluate these policies. OK, I'm going to let some of my colleagues come in the back. Of yes, I think a number of um, members want to come in. Andy Whiteman, followed by Ash Denham. Um, and I think John Mason also. So perhaps, well, um, Andy Whiteman and Ash Denham then, perhaps. Uh, thanks. I want to move away from this question at the moment. I don't have anything to follow up. So maybe, yeah. Yes, I mean, I wanted to speak about GDP. I'm kind of fascinated by this idea of um, what you measure counts. And um, I think even recently, The Economist, which is obviously known for being fairly conservative, concluded after an online debate that GDP is a poor measure of improving living standards. And the OECD um, said that this assumption that growing GDP meant life um, must be getting better. Well, I think we've all moved on from that, and it, we know that it's not quite as simple as that. So, I mean, this is touching on what Gillian Martin mentioned. If we want to measure progress, but our version of progress, and particularly in Scotland, that definitely includes things like environmental sustainability, social inclusion, things like that. Um, Professor campbell Leith, you've just said that there's, there isn't a way to use a big measure to capture progress. Do you think that's definitely true? Other countries, you know, are, or other economy um, foundations like the NEF are developing indexes. I don't know if you've heard of things like um, the Happy Planet Index or the Living Planet Index and so on. Do you think there is a, a place for a big measure that could possibly in the future replace GDP? Uh, well, I think you can construct these big measures, the, the, the whole range of assumptions needed to build it up into an aggregate measure of welfare, which you may or may not like those underpinning assumptions. But in terms of evaluating the, the very large number of individual policies, so, so, so that number may be driven by policy, it may be driven just by external events, which policymakers have no control over whatsoever. So. If you're using this as a means to evaluate the success or failure of policy, it's, it's probably not going to, there's not going to be a strong link. Uh, even in terms of more economic questions and forecasting the devolved taxes, we, we rarely find a robust link between our forecast for these taxes and GDP. So we don't use GDP as a driver of our forecasts for income tax. We use nominal wage growth. It's a far better predictor of, of where, uh, nominal, uh, where uh, income tax revenues will go. So 
it's, 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 a, it's a big headline measure, which there's lots of debate over. There's a big narrative around it. We can talk about the impact of Brexit on GDP and so on. But in terms of evaluating policy, predicting tax revenues, it's, 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 doesn't, it's not used a great deal. And yet, um, governments seem to be judged on it. You know, they seem to be judged on you know, how um, effective their economic choices have been based on how GDP is performing. I mean, we're still doing that at the moment. Yeah, so, but policy will be only one of the factors affecting mm. the GDP number. Yeah. I mean, could, could I just say that you know, some of the problems with GDP, you know, many of the issues that you mentioned, of course, have been known for a very long time. Uh, <clears throat> GDP is a measure of output, and that's the beginning and the end of what it is. It's a gross measure, and as GDP has been periodically redefined, software investment has been put in and so on, all of these very short-lived items of capital have the effect of increasing the gross measure of output, but they have much less impact net of depreciation. And simply looking at net rather than gross would be a considerable improvement. The capital that depreciates you have to replace and you don't become better off by having more depreciation going on in your economy. Mm -hmm. So moving to net rather than gross would be a very big improvement. Secondly, even in real terms, there's a distinction between product and income. Income is measured relative to the costs of consumption, the things that people buy directly and the government buys on their behalf, whereas product reflects you know, the prices of imports and exports. And it would be better to look, if we want a measure of performance, it would be better to look at real national income rather than real GDP. Then you have other issues that uh, GDP, inter as a measure of people's living standards is a plutocratic measure. It gives more weight to the growth of people with the growth that people with high incomes experience than the growth that people with low incomes experience. And one of the things that we're doing at the ESCO is trying to look at ways that might give of producing alternatives that might give equal weight to everyone's growth experience. Bring in Dean Lockhart for a supplemental, and Rebecca Riley may have something to comment on both of these aspects. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd just like to elaborate on this point and get views on the availability of uh, statistics to effectively measure the, the Scottish Government's 4I economic policy, which is uh, inclusive growth, innovation, internationalisation, uh, and investment. Because um, there was a report, report last year by Audit Scotland that seemed to suggest. It's quite difficult to measure some of these factors because things like innovation, um, there might not be readily available uh, statistics to uh, benchmark what's happening with innovation. So do you have views as to you know, how, how we can uh, effectively measure the, the, the success or otherwise of the 4i economic policy? Um, okay, so just with the GDP uh, question, um, which touches on the inclusive growth. So, I mean, I, I think um, there's definitely room for additional measures, as, as Martin was alluding to. And in the ESCO, we are producing these inclusive growth measures uh, for the UK as a whole. Um, whether, the, whether it would be possible to take that down to a, a sub-national level, I don't know uh, if the data is... Um, is um, the sample sizes would be would be adequate uh, for that. I, I just don't I don't know. Um, but you would want I think you know when GDP is just one. It's an important figure, uh, and I think there's plenty of space for these additional measures like that, that, like the inclusive growth measures, or to look at other things like sustainability, etc., uh, in conjunction with um, GDP. Um, in terms of the um, the four I's, so in, in inclusiveness. Uh, is 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 one um, internationalization is um, uh, important. I think you have um, for Scotland you have uh, data on exports uh, to um, the UK. You you have a separate survey to collect this information uh, and also um, to the rest of the world um, and. My understanding is that the, what's, what's missing there from the, this 
Scottish perspective is, is information on um, imports. Um, so, and that, that's complicated by the fact that um, it is a subnational area, uh, and so it's difficult to collect um, information on, on imports. So that's a missing bit of the, of the internationalization picture uh, for Scotland. So that's one area where um, one of the partners within the, within the ESCO is trying to uh, develop um, new measures, or certainly investigating the feasibility of developing uh, new measures of internationalization for uh, Scotland. Um, it could be applied not just to Scotland. I mean, Scotland is a, is, is, uh, a good place to start because there already are quite a lot of data, um, but you could, in principle, maybe roll some of these things out uh, to, to other areas subnationally. Uh, so I, I mentioned this earlier. What, what, one of the things that we're looking into there, and this is the, led by the uh, Fraser of Allender uh, Institute, um, and they were looking at um, novel forms of data to try and better proxy these trade flows uh, across Scotland and the rest of the UK. So it's possible that there's, um, and this, this is taking place over the next 18 months, so there hopefully will be some recommendations on, on what might be feasible in terms of pr improving uh, statistics on internationalization um, for Scotland. Innovation, I mean, there, just from my own experience, there's an innovation survey, of course, um, that's uh, done for the UK, and which um, is a community innovation survey. Um, it may have a slightly different name now, but um, it's, it's a survey that's uh, conducted in a similar way across uh, European countries so that you can compare the innovation activities uh, of the different countries. Um, you do have in that survey, uh, which, which has about, I think, 15,000 observations or something like this, you do have, for the UK, you do have uh, the um, regional information um, as well. Uh, obviously, you'll be ending up with a relatively small sample if, if you're trying to look uh, sub-regionally. Um, so there may be limitations in that way, but there is there is a survey to try and and measure innovation activities in the UK, and you would of course again if you were able to use those data to um, to look at uh, area specific innovation, which I mean it, it may it's possible that this is done. I, I just I don't have the answer. Um, you obviously have the same issues that you have of apportionment with all of these types of um, surveys and admin data, in that if you have a large innovative company, um, well, did their R&D unit operate in Scotland or did it operate somewhere else in the UK? Uh, you may not know. Um, so you'll know where the employment was. Um, and you may also, um, from the in industry coding that you have uh, of plants that underlie these big companies, you may be able to make some assumptions about where the R&D activity uh, took place, but you have these additional complications um, as with as with other data coming from these surveys. Thank you. I wonder if uh, other members of the panel might have views on this. Okay, I, mean, well, I think the, the, the kind of four I this is kind of very large, high level concepts. But I understand there's a kind of list of targets by which the government wants to be assessed on these associated with these these targets. Mm -hmm. So clearly, there must be data to evaluate these these, these targets. Uh, there's maybe a slight danger in specifying exactly how a kind of high-level concept is going to be assessed with a very specific target. Just as if you want to assess the, the quality of the school system by introducing a, a test for literacy at a certain age, there's, there's always the danger that teachers teach to the test in order to improve achievement of the target without necessarily fulfilling the wider, higher level objective of improving literacy throughout the school system. So you may not want to be too tied to specific targets or make sure they're not targets that can be manipulated easily. They actually do capture uh, what's happening to that <coughs> specific area. I think you also, this goes back to an earlier point, that 
the, the individual policies that will be introduced to achieve these higher level objectives will be a kind of, there'll be lots of them. They'll be looking at very specific things, uh, hopefully contributing a little to the higher level objective. And perhaps you're more interested in the micro data that assesses that specific policy. A higher level objective may or may not be achieved. It may be achieved because of policy. It may be achieved just by good luck. Uh, it may have been blown off course by bad luck. The policies were good, but just the way the world evolved at that point in time, just the, the fate was against it. So, so, you, so you want to hone your data to actually assess the thing you have control over. Sorry, could I just make one further observation on that? Not only do you want to hone your data, but you have to be rather careful about the way in which you do it. And the example that sticks in my mind was when the... Uh, uh, well, it was the UK government, but it was, applied to, it was applied to GCSEs, so obviously wasn't relevant to Scotland. The target was the proportion of children getting five grade A to C GCSEs. And because the target was defined in that way, teaching tended to focus very much on the children who were on the boundary between four and five to try and push them over five. If you had had some target defined instead, say, of the average GCSE score with some scoring metric, then teaching resources would have been devoted rather differently. Now, obviously, it's a question for policy makers whether they do want to focus resources at the 4-5 uh, GCSE margin, but uh, my guess is that that was simply adopted as a quick and easy target without anyone having thought of the consequences. Mm. So when you do try and assess performance, you know, <clears throat> the performance relative to the four eyes using specific target, you actually need to think rather carefully, am I doing something that, uh, no, am I choosing my target in a way that uh, actually achieves the policy that I want to achieve, or is it, you know, going to deliver an outcome that ex post I may not be very happy with? Thank you. One very quick follow-up, if I may. Is there an internationally uh, recognised definition of inclusive growth, for example, OECD, or is it one of those concepts that tends to mean different things to different people? I'm not aware of an internationally agreed definition. Okay. I don't know, maybe my colleagues are. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now on to Andy Whiteman. I thank that next convener. Um, I mean, a question has arisen in this uh, debate around Scottish data as to whether Scotland should have more autonomy in the collection of data. I mean, at the moment, it doesn't have statutory powers to collect data. Um, as we heard, there may be issues with the Digital e Economy Act. Um, I was interested in the Royal Statistical Society's uh, evidence here that RSS does not believe it's an, an appropriate time for Scottish Government to move away from the current system in which ONS produces economic statistics for the whole of the UK. I think the pr problem we've heard, not just in this inquiry, but in previous evidence sessions, is that the data we have that relies on UK data, relies on subnational samples, relies on um, perhaps uh, additional surveys being done in Scotland, is not actually terribly reliable. So I'm just wondering, um, why RSS is so clear that this is not the appropriate time, given that the Scottish Government is not like other UK government departments. I mean, it's uh, an executive that reports to a parliament that's trying to grow the whole of the economy using a variety of measures like improving education, etc., to have an impact on the economic performance of a whole jurisdiction. Sorry, since no, that was a question asked with reference to the RSS, could I... Uh, say something on that. First of all, of course, there is one area where Scotland does have you know, its own statistical authority, and that is with the Registrar General. And I think for people who want to understand what's happening to the population in the whole of the United Kingdom, that actually is a source of problems which people would feel uncomfortable with about being replicated elsewhere. If you look at the you know, ONS website, for example, it's often quite a lot of work to find statistics that relate to the whole of the United Kingdom rather than England and Wales. Uh, 
there were issues, I remember, from the 2001 census, how you treat very small numbers of returns. You can't publish data which show only one person in a particular cell because statisticians regard that sort of thing as disclosive, even if it's only the people who can identify themselves. And the Scottish Registrar General adopted, as far as I remember, a different solution to that problem from the solution that was adopted in England and Wales. And no, we ended up with two censuses that at a high level fitted together, but when you went into the detail, didn't fit together and no, didn't allow people to make the sorts of comparisons between what was happening in Scotland and what was happening in England as easily as they would have liked. So with that sort of warning, no, I must say I do feel rather nervous about it. The issues that you mentioned over the quality of the Scottish data, though I should say I see very much as being a consequence of no, someone's assessment of benefits relative to cost rather than a problem with the statistical powers of the Scottish Government. And, uh, no, if you want better quality data, and, no, it's a particular problem that arises in a relatively small jurisdiction, no, the, the performance of a survey depends only very slightly on the proportion of the population that you survey. It depends mainly on the number of people in the sample. So if you wanted Scottish data to be as good as data, no, the Scottish data from your sample surveys to be as good as the data you get for the whole of the United Kingdom, you would need a Scottish survey with a sample size much the same size as is used for the whole of the United Kingdom. And to my mind, that's the fundamental trade-off you face. It's not a problem of whether the Scottish Government has enough powers or not. Or put it another way, you know, if I wanted you know, to investigate that further, what is it that the Scottish Government would like to be able to do and is prepared to pay to do that it finds it can't do because of the legislation, because of the current statutory arrangements? Yeah, I think I tend, tend to agree. I think I'm quite happy with the UK SA being the kind of overall regulator of the statistics and assessment of their quality. And, and then I would want the Scottish statisticians to be active partners with the ONS uh, in generating the data for Scotland. So pi piggybacking off the surveys that are already done, the data is already generated, augmenting them where necessary and where funds are available to pr improve quality or, or scope of statistics. Okay. Um, another question related to, um, you mentioned the Registrar General, I mean, we have other agencies that collect data like the Registrar of Scotland, for example, um, but their data is all, you would pay for it, three pounds plus VAT for every bit of data. Um, in general terms, do you believe that all, all data, economic data, should be open? I think you need to be very careful. I mean, there are two questions. What do you mean by open and whether you charge people for access? Uh, no, I do remember hearing the view that no, data should just be collected and made available and users should make of them what they want. Now, that seems to me completely to ignore the role of statistics as a science, which is how to draw inferences from what I would call raw data. I think you know, the statistical science has developed over the last, what, 100, 150 years, and it focuses people's attention. It you know, saves a lot of work, so I certainly wouldn't want that sort of openness. On the question whether users of public data should be expected to pay for them, I'm afraid I don't know what it is one is charged three pounds for, but over the last 20 years there or so, there has been a move away from the ONS, you know, wanting to charge people, wanting to collect money, to making statistics freely available over the internet, and I think that's been thoroughly a good thing. So, my, while I don't know the specifics of you know, the example you're giving, my general view is that official data prepared by statisticians so that they show the answers to questions that uh, you know, 
the, the, the answers to material questions rather than just being an amorphous mass of statistics, of, nu of numbers. Uh, statistical data prepared by statisticians in general, I would think, should be freely available. But you may have some circumstances where people do want very bespoke things, say, from the census. And, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't say that it's never appropriate to charge people, particularly if they're asking for a piece of ad hoc work. Um, I think that uh, obviously statistics are, a, are official data, are public good, uh, and um, uh, that's very important. Um, on the the issue of paying three pounds, I don't I don't know exactly what 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 um, the example is, but um, there there has been a uh, move towards making micro data available um, at no cost. Uh, much more widely, uh, and, and I think that is a very good thing. It's an, enabled um, researchers to uh, ask new questions and analyze the data in different ways um, that the uh, statistics office maybe isn't uh, focusing on. Um, so, so I think it is important to, to uh, make data available so people can uh, look at uh, the range of questions you might address with those data. Um, at the same time, I think when you do that, uh, it's important that um, users are using the information. I mean, I think at the moment when you use those data, it has to be for a public good purpose. Uh, so that there is there is that, um, that that's an important aspect of having access to those data. That it has to be for the public good. Um, but one of the things I would I would uh, point out is that when users are using these micro data. Um, they may use them in very different ways for good reasons than um, the statistics office. But it's important then that we have information on what these data actually are so that people can use them um, in an educated way so that we don't draw um, incorrect inference from, from those things. So I think it's important when you are provi I think it's very useful that these data are provided through things like the virtual microdata laboratory uh, to allow projects for the public good. Um, and it's important that that is accompanied by uh, explanation, documentation of the, of the underlying data so that it can be used in the best way possible. Okay, thank you. I would agree. Right, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to another area because we're running out of time here. Perhaps a very brief follow-up from Gordon MacDonald and then a question from Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Just a very quick question on Andy's original point about whether there should be a separate Scottish Statistics Authority. Given that Northern Ireland has its own statistics and research agency with a staff of, according to its last accounts, 412 with 301 statisticians, why is it necessary for one part of the UK to have its own statistics authority and yet you feel that it shouldn't be the case for Scotland? Sorry, I mean, could I answer that, you know, partly with reference to what, you know, I was seeing when I was a member of the Statistics Commission, mm -hmm. and, you no, know, this was in the early days of devolution, soon mm -hmm. after 2000, and one of the big concerns we had was that the United Kingdom w was, you know, tending to fall further apart statistically, that, uh, you know, it was partic particularly with reference to Scotland, the Scottish Health Service was collecting ad different administrative data mm -hmm. from the English Health Service, mm -hmm. no, for very good reasons. It wanted to do different things, and that was the purpose of devolution, mm -hmm. after all, to allow it mm -hmm. to do different things. But uh, in terms of wanting to know what was happening throughout the United Kingdom, it, uh, uh, it of course, made it harder. No, in the 2007 Act, I think it was recognised that uh, no, the Statistics and Registration Service Act, I think it was recognised that an important part of the statistical service was producing st uh, comparable statistics for the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, of course, Northern Ireland's history is different from the history of Scotland. My preference would be... no to 
No, I, I, I don't know the, Scot the Northern Irish statistical arrangements and the way in which they work, but my preference would be to try and you know, run as much as possible on a UK-wide basis so as to maintain uh, comparability, so as to ensure that you know, the same approaches are you know, the, the di what superficially look like the same data actually mean the same thing for the different constituent parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, so at the very least, I you know, would be reluctant to follow the Northern Ireland model simply because it's what history has delivered us for Northern Ireland. Uh, I mean, you do already find that there are some surveys that are only for Great Britain and not for Northern Ireland as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of users just tend to ignore that uh, or may not pay enough attention to, you know, to know that this is the case. But uh, I, 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 I would, you know, in statistical terms, I think there's a lot to be said for having a, picture, a good picture of the whole of the United Kingdom and then you know, meeting the needs of the devolved administrations within that rather than what could easily turn into something of a patchwork quilt. And of course, in economic terms, Scotland is much more important than Northern Ireland. So if one were go to go down this, to this path, the risk of disruption to statistics which are representative of the whole of the United Kingdom would seem to me to be much greater. But surely the question should be, is Scotland well served by the ONS? Given that the ONS is over 3,000 staff, and in many cases we don't get as much uh, Scottish sub-data from UK subsets, surely that should be the question, whether we're getting value for money from the ONS. Well, as I say, I would have thought that a lot of the issue with subsets is the, you know, particularly from survey-based data, mm -hmm. is the issue of how much mm -hmm. one is prepared to pay the, you know, to boost the sample and... Uh, Going back to what I said right at the beginning, it's easy to see how you would, could have better statistics, but better statistics do cost money. But that effectively would be us paying twice, because we're already paying to support the ONS, not to provide the service we require, and therefore you're asking us to pay for it twice. Well, as to, as to how the you know, ONS you know, how the ONS is financed relative to contributions from Scotland is an area I'd, I'm afraid I'd rather not get into because it's something on which I certainly don't regard myself as expert. Uh, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I mean you might say that. Sorry to interrupt. I think we're we're running up against our time limits here. Um, so I just wonder if the other two. Uh, Panel members on that point, I think, have a very brief opinion to express. Uh, well, I mean, look, looking at the kind of CPI statistics, for example, I think the, the the kind of sampling done in Scotland is more or less proportional to the population of Scotland. So, it's in order to get representative data for the whole of the UK, you have to spread out your sample with, with appropriate weights uh, throughout the UK. Now, in order then to produce statistics for Scotland, that size of sample may not be enough. So the, then the question is, do you want to augment that sample by just enough to create the quality statistic separately for Scotland? And, and that's the cost-benefit analysis you, you need to think through. Right, thank you. And finally, a question from Jamie Halko Johnson. Thank you, Kavita. It was, it's largely actually been answered um, uh, throughout this uh, discussion this morning, but it was really just to look at, um, I represent the Highlands and Islands, obviously a large and diverse area, diverse economy with different sectors, um, and I'm sure um, most members do. I was just wondering about the, the local nature of data, um, basically how, whether there is data that we can use at the moment that give us better local picture within, within the regions of Scotland or within um, uh, even the council areas um, and how that can play a role in providing perhaps a, uh, or there's a scope for that providing more a role in producing a, natu nat uh, a national picture. So you're right. I mean, this, this goes back to the admin data mm. that's available. So I, th I think there are plans. Uh, certainly I read something uh, uh, by the um, group at ONS who uh, look at... Um, Subnational statistics, that there are plans for developing um, local area statistics, and I think also that was one of the recommendations in the Bean Review. And if you have a near census uh, that the admin data provide, uh, you should be able to um, 
create statistics at lower level geographies um, in different, uh, with different types of boundaries. Obviously, all of the questions that apply to, or all of the issues that apply in uh, creating subnational statistics for countries like Scotland would be possibly even magnified. I mean, they're not, they won't go away. They'll be, they'll be an issue and, and maybe also magnified when you get a smaller, uh, a much smaller un unit of economic activity. Maybe just in, ter in terms of uh, forecasting devolved uh, taxes as well, there's, there's a sub-Scottish regional element to those as well. And certainly in terms of LBTT, they'll be focused on the big cities will be the major generators of those, those tax revenues. The higher rate taxpayers as well will tend to be concentrated in, in the same areas. So this kind of regional breakdown can, can help forecast these taxes as well. So you probably want different breakdowns for assessing policy interventions on different groups and then other breakdowns for forecasting revenues, which uh, d depends what, what decisions you're making. All right, well, I'd like to thank our witnesses for coming in today. Thank you very much. I'll now suspend the session to allow our next panel of witnesses to take their places. Thank you.
Well, welcome to our second panel of witnesses today. In no particular order, we have uh, Russell Gunson, Director of IPPR Scotland, Gil Donald, who is a member of the Economic Advisory Group Reform Scotland, Craig DL, Head of Research at Commonweal, and Graham Maxton, who is the Secretary General of the Club of Rome. I wonder if I could start with a, a fairly general question, which is about what each of you would view as being the strengths and weaknesses in the current suite of economic statistics or data for Scotland and how these might be addressed. Uh, and I should say that uh, the sound desk will operate the, the microphone, so there's no need to um, push any buttons. And indeed, if you want to come in on the discussion at any point, just indicate by raising your hand. So I wonder if we could start. Who would like to start matters off here? Oh, Russell Gunson. Yes. Um, in terms of strength, so I think it's clear it depends what you're looking for from the data. So as a sub-state part of the UK, a nation within the UK, we're clearly stronger than most other parts of the UK at most of the data that we collect uh, and can use and have access to. However, compared to an independent country or UK level where we have weaker in general um, data to draw upon. I think in terms of the strengths and weaknesses within that, um, it's clear that at the macro level there's some big gaps. So imports, exports, inflation, there's uh, whole government accounts that we're missing. Um, clear weaknesses there. Um, and I think actually the, the biggest weakness for me, but this is perhaps my perspective coming from the organisation that I do, would be around the analytical side of things. So in, in terms of the remit for the committees looking at this, in terms of interpretation and in terms of scrutiny. So yes, we can improve collection. Yes, we can improve the sharing and linking of that data. But most of all, I think we can improve the, an the analysis and the capability within government and outside of government to be learning lessons and developing solutions from that data. I think I should have went first. Russell stole all my lines. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, wholeheartedly agree with everything that has just been said there. Um, I think when we're looking at data, we do need to look at why we're looking at it. We need to be asking you know, the question, what is the purpose of the data? Um, and sometimes we will go out asking a question to form a policy and find the data is lacking or insufficient. Sometimes we might even find we're gathering data and it's just being gathered as a matter of routine and it's not being, not much is being done with it at the moment. Um, so there's, while we're looking at the, the strengths and the weaknesses of the data, I think we do need to have a, a broader look at the, the, the overall strategy of, of just basically why we're doing all this. Thank you. And um, I, can't, I can't talk specifically about Scotland's policies because I, I don't live here. Any, I, mean, I was born in Scotland, but I don't live here now. I live in Switzerland. And we take a global perspective. But what I can talk about is, is what you measure and what you should measure. Uh, because what you measure determines not just your policy, but the opinions of the people in your country. And measuring GDP and tracking GDP is a very bad measure of social progress, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, there are many better measures of economic development and social development. And if the Scottish Government is going to set up some sort of separate statistical organisation, then you have a, a very rare opportunity to redraw the boundaries about what is being measured and then you can influence policy in a fundamentally different way. And you can also change the opinions of Scottish people about what they want from their economy and their society. So you have an opportunity to, to, to I think, lead the world to some extent by setting up a new statistical organisation only if you choose to measure the right things. Yeah, I, I agree with Russell's point. There, there, are, um, there are gaps, uh, whole of government accounts being one of them. Um, however, I, I, I would defer to Graham Roy, who said that uh, GERS provides a pretty accurate picture of where Scotland is economically. It, it is not definitive. It cannot be definitive. No statistical model can, can ever be so. No data set can be. Uh, a strength I see that I probably hadn't realised was that the, um, the objectives are in place. There, there are basically... Uh, 
Scotland has the, uh, an economic strategy, it has purpose targets, it has national indicators, and it has the four eyes. That's a strength because the structure exists. Where it, it's weak, in my view, is that the statistics need to be applied to these different objectives. If we want economic growth to happen, then by what percentage? And then we should measure ourselves against that. It seems to me there's an amorphous mass of data and we can run around looking at all the, all the trees in the forest, but what is the direction of travel? What are objectives annually and over three to five years against those criteria of growth, against innovation, against those four eyes? And then we measure according to that. And if there are shortages and gaps, then we fill them according to those objectives. But the objectives comes first and the data comes second, in my view. And I, I think there's a, a bit of a gap between that at the moment. Thank you. I think that leads on to a question Gil Patterson had. Yeah. So, what are the key gaps in coverage for Scotland and what are your priorities when filling them? Who would like to address that? Yeah. yeah. What are the key gaps in coverage for Scotland and what are your priorities when filling them? Key gaps in terms of data? Yes. Well, again... I'm, like Graham, I'm not a data expert. I, I think that there's a regional gap. You know, Aberdeen's economy is very different to Glasgow's, is different to Edinburgh's, is different to the Highlands. Each have different priorities. If you identify the objectives for economic growth in each of these areas, they'll be completely different. That's a gap because we don't have that at the moment. We have a macro picture across Scotland. The objectives that we've got tend to be very general. I'm not sure we're tying in the local data and, and having synergy with local data uh, that, that matches in with that, particularly the local, uh, Scottish local government financial statistics, which are pretty detailed. So I think there's a regional gap that needs to be addressed. I just wanted to, to pick up on something that Gil said, because I, I have a, quite a different view on this. The idea of trying to stimulate economic growth is exactly what I'm talking about as being the wrong policy. We, the, Europe does not need growth. If you take the GDP of Europe and divide it by the population, there is enough economic wealth, income, and work for everyone. The problem is one of distribution, that it's not evenly distributed. Now, we have a basic idea, most of us have a basic idea, that economic growth creates jobs, that economic growth reduces inequality, that economic growth reduces poverty. All those are false assumptions. Economic growth does not create jobs, it does not reduce inequality, and it does not reduce poverty. What you need to do is focus on well-being, the overall standard of living for the Scottish population, and how to boost that, which is down to education and health and a whole bundle of different measures of happiness and satisfaction. Economic growth is not the key, and that's what I mean about measuring the right things and about having an opportunity to change what you measure because it changes what you do. Just to add to Graham there, yes... Um I think one important point is we can't boil an economy down to one number like GDP or even down to something like well-being or happiness. You will need a full suite of um, measurements to, to do this adequately. I definitely agree that we're, we're quite weak on some of the regional data, um, especially when it's derived from UK subsets or even Scottish subsets. Um, that said, some of the data that's being generated from local authorities directly can be quite good because they're quite focused. They know exactly what they're asking the question and they're going and looking for, the, for a, a direct answer. Um, another big weakness, weakness that I know our folk in, in other sessions have picked up is, is data on trade. That um, We've got very limited data on Scottish exports uh, and almost no data on Scottish imports, so we, we can't really to talk about Scotland's balance of trade, particularly within the UK, and that's maybe just a, 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 um, a consequence of, a, of Scotland being a part of the UK. Intra-UK trade isn't so important from an economic point of view. It can be from a politics point of view. And this is maybe another, another step that we could come across in, in these conversations is, are we looking for data to make an economic point, or are we looking, to, looking at it to make a political point both might be valid, but both might be different questions. I think for me, so I mentioned a couple already around imports, exports, the trade statistics that Craig refers to. Inflation, again, looking at a, a Scottish measure of inflation seems to me to be more and more pressing as, for example, social security powers have devolved. We already have other payments that um, the inflation rate in Scotland would probably be more relevant for. I think as, aside from those things I mentioned, I think productivity is a key um, uh, 
key issue that needs to be measured and we need to get underneath productivity. I think this came up last week in a much better way, not just within Scotland, actually. This is something uh, that is a challenge across the world to understand what the key constituent elements are and what sits underneath both um, our success and productivity in parts of our economy and our, our lack of success in other parts. So in a way, there's some, if you like, core macro measures that are missing. Um, to the side of that, I think where our focus should be is around, and it, it probably leads on from Graham's earlier point, around what do we need for our policy making specific to Scotland. So there will be core things that need to be um, comparable with the rest of the UK or internationally, but there are things that matter just for Scotland and for policy making in Scotland, which probably stem from the economic strategy and equally stem from the national performance framework, which I know is currently being reviewed. But it may well stray much more into the territory of inclusive growth or well-being. Um, but those, I think, are missing. And I think uh, we can have a look at what would make sense there. And I think, again, um, a previous point from Gil around the sub-Scotland level. We have so many different, we've regionalised everything in a way, but with, without the same borders often, um, or boundaries, should I say. So we have city deals, we have local authorities, we have uh, regional college areas, we have um, so on and so forth, the new education, regional improvement collectives, for example, all on different boundaries, uh, developing young uh, workforce. Finding ways, maybe with micro data, to build up from the bottom should allow us um, to have data that works for all of those regions. Um, because that's incredibly important to make sure that we can scrutinise the impact from, for example, city deal investment, from example, the regional changes that we're making policy-wise. So I think regional, or at least sub-Scotland, to the side of macro, and then there's some clear macro um, data that we're missing too. There's a, I think there's kind of three options open to us that we, uh, does the, the, the Parliament push uh, for a devolved, uh, totally devolved system like Northern Ireland, or do we look to the ONS to have a statutory involvement with them so that it's not, it comes automatically, or do we just stick with what we've got at the present time and put more resources into the subsets? And, uh, you know, so you're just, you know, homing in in some parts of it rather than getting it across the board? You start with what you need. What do we need? And I've already said, I think, you know, Aberdeen needs is different from Glasgow. So we, that job needs to be done. Then it needs to be done on, on a Scottish level. And then, being cynical, I would work with anyone to get the best data from wherever we can get it. And it might be on energy. We might be wanting data from Norway or Denmark on clean energy, for example. It might just not be... ONS, but the available sources that we have that are, e that are excellent in their fields, then we should use them. But we need to define what it is we need, and I'm not sure that we're doing that because of this continuous focus on, well, we want, you know, two point, was it, we've got to keep our, what's our purpose target? Yeah. To raise GDP growth at a rate to a UK level, which is why we find ourselves in this debate on GERS. I, 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 that's just too general. It needs to be far more Scottish specific and regionalised and that everything spills from there and you go and collect the data that fits. I suppose it's a chicken and egg thing though, isn't it? Like running a business. I, I mean, yeah. with, the, the, with the stats that we see, that in my view, you couldn't run a business. No, I, like I, exactly. that's the way I think about guilt. So that, I, I, yeah. yeah, but you know, so from me, I would look at exactly how I'm performing at the present time, analyse that and make my decision. Yeah. So, is it not the case that you would need the stats first, quality stats, or, or quantity? It looks like in Scotland, it looks like quantitative rather than quality before you make your move. Well, okay. Or can you do it in a different way? I think so. Well, look at Aberdeen. Let's take Aberdeen. We know there's a looming crisis up there in oil and gas. Once the decommissioning money is spent, what happens to Aberdeen? What do we do with Aberdeen? That, uh, you're not going to get any statistics going to be the answer to that. You guys need to get the answer to that. Now, to me, we've got an energy resource in terms of talent and, and, and a great university up there. Why don't we look at doing something where that is Britain's centre of excellence in energy? Now, that requires investment in education. It requires focus. You need to attract young, talented people that businesses will then come, like Cambridge and Biotech, and go, we want to invest in this. 
That comes first, not the data. Okay. And um, the question of whether we need a separate um, and new powers in order to do so, statistical agency. I think I, the outcome you want is to retain a core of statistics that you can compare across the UK and internationally. And then equally, as I've said, um, a set of much more Scottish specific statistics to the side of that that allow us to do policy making that's much more specific to us. Now, just, uh, I know this has, this has come up earlier today and last week, but the risk in going fully over to the um, full devolution independent statistic authority is that you risk the comparisons, uh, the risk in, in the status quo is that we can't get the data that we want um, for our own policy making. So I would guess that there's there's a middle way, dare I say it, um, that allows us probably, yes, with new powers, to ensure that we can get the data we need for the Scottish specific uh, data, but to keep, whether that's through a voluntary arrangement or not, to keep in with some of these UK-wide and more international comparative data uh, arrangements too. Even within your, your range of options there, um, if we, we did move to a model of creating a Scottish statistics agency, um, this, this could be a model that is very centralised, one body that does all of the stats that Scotland needs. It could also be a fairly decentralised network of groups of specialist organisations looking at very specific areas. Both of these models are valid. Countries move up and down that spectrum. Scotland right now is a fairly hybrid system where we have a relatively decentralised statistics network pulling in stats from different bodies, but we're also quite reliant on a fairly centralised UK system. Um, so I think if one, one of the ideas that Commonweal is developing at the moment is if we are developing a Scottish statistics agency, then maybe it could, it could take the view of a, a more overseer role that provides the ONS provides things like uh, um, methodological kite marks to say that this piece of statistics is worthy for policy making. If Scotland is wanting to go above and beyond that standard, maybe we need to think about a Scottish specific kite mark for these, uh, these decentralised bodies to say that their work is, is worthy, of uh, worthy of examining for policy making purposes. You could also think about going beyond just government organisations. You could have um, groups like Commonwealth, like Fraser or Valander, if they produce research, maybe. Um, if it is adhering to the, the appropriate levels of methodological standards, they could get a secondary kite mark. So you can pull in data from more than just government sources. Um, thank you. I think Jamie Halcor Johnson wanted to ask about this aspect of regional data collection. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Kavita. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting that, that, that there seems to be a kind of wide widespread acceptance that um, that the, one of the gaps is in this regional data or this um, local data. Um, I just wondered, kind of, what what data there is currently available. Is there enough to form um, either something focused on, say, the northeast or Aberdeen, or within council areas? And if if not, what can we do to kind of what can we do to get that? Administrative data or micro data um, to decide particularly around business. There's a business survey that um, gets almost to census level. As we move on with income tax and VAT, um, uh, VAT is particularly problematic, but income tax should provide, uh, or HMA, HMRC should have and hopefully provide data at a very, very household, very individual level for us that should be very useful for this. Um, Beyond that, it seems with the city deals, with local authorities, again, those regions I mentioned, there's a lot of um, collection happening within those uh, entities and actors, if you like. And I think um, it leads to an overall point for me, which is um, there may well be a lot of data out there already. Uh, I'm sure it's not enough, and I'm sure it could be improved. But where we really are lacking is the ability to analyse that data, learn the lessons from it, and begin to develop solutions for you and for others at different levels of, of decision making, mm -hmm. um, or at least options. So I think there's a lot of data out there right now. We can improve it, but actually where, the, where we've got furthest to go is around that independent analysis and scrutiny of what's happening so that we can learn the lessons and we can develop solutions to those.
Um, we, we would start, our recommendation is to start with the Scottish Local Government financial statistics, which we, we just see as not being optimised against the chairs and government statistics. So that there's a good start point there um, that would take us forward from where we are at the moment. Okay, and we have a, a follow-up from Gordon MacDonald before we move on to just a different area with uh, John Mason. A, a very quick couple of questions. Um, in terms of the, the two issues I see so far is the point about the lack of regional stats for Scotland and also some kind of Scottish inflation measure, if I understand this correct. So two points on that. One, is, is the ONS capable of providing that for Scotland? Or is it a need of change in political will? I mean, basically. And secondly, if there was a separate Scottish statistics authority, um, I accept the point that we need some commonality between what's measured in Scotland and what's measured in the UK. But is there a set of international um, standards for economic statistics that everybody has signed up to? I'm thinking about the likes of the OECD, where there is a lot of, what, 75 countries compare various uh, measurements. I mean, is there a set of international standards that everybody would sign up to? On the last question, yes, there's a, there's a fair few of them. As I understand it, I couldn't describe myself as an expert in it, but there's UN, there's OECD, there's EU, um, and we can continue to adhere to the EU um, regulations around it, even if we're outside. Um, the, the point being, though, that they are, um, so you heard from the previous panel, they're at a high level by their very nature. Mm. So you would, at the very micro level, still potentially see differences that get in the way of uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, the implication in the question is there's nothing to stop us keeping that comparability across the UK mm -hmm. and internationally, even with an independent statistics authority, that would be the case. Um, I think it's down to behaviour, culture. For all of this, um, it also comes down to funding, though. So whoever, you know, whether it's an independent agency in Scotland, whether it's ONS doing it, take inflation, for example, it will cost a lot of money. Um, it will cost more than 10% of their budget to do uh, a population equivalent for Scotland for mm -hmm. inflation. And where does that money come from? You can make a case, UK government, given we have devolution, it's a, uh, you know, a UK decision in essence for that to happen. You can make a case for Scotland to fund it because it's something that we want as a bespoke package. But either way, the money must be found almost regardless of where the power lies. Thank you. Although that said, um, the, the point of gathering this data is to try and, uh, and I, I would hope, improve the economy of the country. So um, you should always be looking at a view of, yes, it will cost money, but what are the benefits? Uh, can, it, would you make that money back just through the, mm -hmm. the, the benefits of it via economic growth or better well better well-being? Yeah, I, I don't think it's an OS, ONS issue. My, my, my priority, and I'm going to get very boring today, is regional, is regional data and how we improve that with these different economies that we have within Scotland. Thank you. And John Mason. Uh, th thanks, Convener. If I could just start with a, a supplementary. I mean, we've previously, one or two folk have mentioned whole of government accounts as being something that's missing. Could you, could you just explain to us why that's important? You know, what... what what we haven't got because we don't have whole of government accounts? The, one of the main things is around, um, well, there's a few, there's liabilities, there's, there's um, also assets, there is imports and exports, but most of all, there's just a very, a much more accurate uh, understanding of what is being spent in and on behalf of Scotland and what equally um, is being brought in in and on behalf of Scotland. So it would be a much more accurate way of measuring our performance as an economy and as a, a spending and income raising uh, government. Okay. It does tend to avoid um, sort of balance sheet trickery, PFI being a classic, so you can park that into the future. It remains a liability, but it might not appeal in your, appear, it won't appear in JERS, but it is a liability in the long term. And the whole of government accounts allows you to pick that up and mark it as something you owe in the future. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks very much. And my main question then, um, <coughs> we've had slightly different um, evidence, I think, from different witnesses. Um, one is that users and producers of data should be talking to each other so that the users are producing 
what the sorry the producers are producing what the users want or need. And then there's also been the idea that, um, well, maybe it's not a good idea that the government is both producing and is a user of the data. So I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around this as to how we get this balance right between a bit of independence, but a bit of working together. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that if you're forming a, a Scottish statistics agency, it would have to be kept um, at arm's length, uh, fairly independent from, from the government. Um, I think we saw uh, the, the, other, the other week when the, the, the ONS had some comments uh, towards Boris Johnson, the, the kind of benefits for that, being able to speak truth to power. Right, but I mean, if there's this kind of kite mark thing and whoever yeah. produces the stats, be it even private sector, third sector, whoever, has to get this stamp, yeah. I mean, wh why does it actually matter who produces them then? Um, well, it, it, might, it might not. If you're wanting a, a fairly decentralised model looking at people who have specific expertise in a specific area, then you, you go to whoever can produce that data. Uh, and this is the point, you, 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 you simply ask for them to produce it at a sufficiently high level, and it would be the mm -hmm. Scottish Statistics Agency's role to set that level, to regulate it, and to gather the data and be able to combine it in a way that, to allow communication between, uh, between the different, uh, different groups and allow people to gather and process the data. So is it how the data is being used and potentially twisted, mm -hmm. rather than who's actually producing the hard core? Uh, interpretation is always the, 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 the side problem that goes along with this data. Anyone can, can pull out what they can sometimes pull out exactly what they want to make their political point, for instance. Um, and there are ways of addressing that as well by, by potentially demanding that whenever someone produces a body of statistics, they also publish the methodology behind it so it can be properly scrutinised. I think with, okay. um, so this independence, almost within government independence, is what we're talking about within the sphere of government, if you like. So should we have an independent statistics authority here that separates out the, as you say, the producing of the data and the using of the data within government? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that um, you know, what that's trying to tackle is whether there's any undue influence, even inadvertently, of the people that are producing from the people that want to use that data. I would guess that, you know, by its very nature, you would struggle to avoid that but there are benefits that you allude to around making sure that what's produced is useful, for example. And I don't think that it's a big, uh, you know, maybe again, this is um, a view based on, you know, just my perception, but I don't see that as a big issue in terms of undue influence. Where I see a big issue is around, if, if what we're trying to do through having an independent statistics authority is have much greater scrutiny of government decisions and much more support for potential options, that isn't the route that you would achieve those things. Down in the rest of the UK and other countries, that independent scrutiny comes from journalists and newspapers, it comes from stakeholders and civil society organisations, it comes from the likes of the organisations around here. Um, and it's in that territory, if you're trying to achieve greater scrutiny, greater support for decisions, that we need to, to see greater capacity, I would argue. So uh, it depends what you're trying to achieve. I don't see it as a big issue that, you know, hammer to crack a nut territory. But where the big issue is, I think, is around outside of government and the independence and the scrutiny capability there. OK. Yeah, it's interesting that, that, that we have the talent up here. Um, Graham Roy has taken on the, the Fraser of Allender Institute role, uh, and he's outstanding. Uh, you, need, you only need to look at the IFS and how the regard in which it's held as an independent body doing some excellent work across a range of economic subjects uh, in the UK uh, to see what we could do with the likes of the Fraser of Allender. To me, a Scottish IFS and, and using Graham Roy and his team would be, would give you that level of independent data inquiry that um, perhaps is missing at the moment because I, relative to the UK, it's completely underfunded. But the UK is 10 times the size of us. I mean, we just can't afford to copy everything that they do. No, I, no it's not a case of copying. But I think um, when you look at the IFS and, and the credibility that the IFS gets and the quality of the work they produce, um, we could do with some of that. And there's no point in having a Fraser of Allender Institute that's funded for a few hundred grand when IFS is funded at four million and making an impact across the UK. Mm -hmm. If you would not mind me coming back in, is not new money. So there are, there's a, 
great deal of money that goes out the door through the Scottish Government and through the SFC, for example, around academic research. And um, it's going for very good, impactful things, no doubt. But there is a decision, I think, for you all uh, and beyond your colleagues as to whether any of that should be going more towards helping you make decisions around the economy, for example, helping other committees make the decisions around Brexit, around demographic change, around these big issues that we know are coming, that we can begin to analyse the problem, but we're not getting near to um, developing solutions to. So some of this may not be new money, um, and ultimately it comes down to not copying everything that uh, exists in the rest of the UK or internationally, but working out what we need and what's missing. And I'd argue maybe an IFS equivalent, maybe wider than that actually, um, would be necessary and something worth copying um, from existing funds. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I, I wonder before I bring Gillian Martin in for a, a supplementary, um, on that point about international experience, um, Graham Maxton, I, I appreciate we're perhaps a bit Scottocentric in this committee, which is unsurprising since it is a Scottish parliamentary committee and that's our job. But I'm just wondering if you have any examples from your international experience or points to make about how um, different regions or areas gather useful data, or if, there, if there's international practice that might be relevant here that we could look to? Um, I mean, there are, there, are, there are some bodies that are clearly very good at this, the UN, the OECD. Uh, there are some countries that are better than others. Uh, but if I can just make an observation, just listening to the conversation before and now, it seems to me that, that, that this is being approached from a bottom-up way rather than a top-down way. That you're, you're saying to yourself, well, we need to collect data. How do we organize the collection of that data? Where should that data be collected? Should it be regional? Should it be Scottish? Should it be London? And <clears throat> the first conversation should, should, to me, be about what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to achieve as a nation? And once you've answered that question, you say, OK, how do we measure whether or not we're achieving that? And then you say to yourself, OK, how do we collect the data to measure that? And where do we collect the data? But setting up a statistical office because, it is a political decision, it sounds like, what's, what the discussion around here about, about creating a, a Scottish office for, for, for statistics. But that's not what I'm here to talk about, really, because I don't understand that. What I can tell you about is that if you want to achieve something different as a nation, then set your goal, work out what measures you're going to have to, to, to track progress with that goal, and then measure those. That's the most important part if you're going to, if you're going to move Scotland forward from, from where I'm sitting. And is, is there a nation that you could give, or an area, as an example of where that has been done? There are lots of people who have been trying to do this. The, 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 the Bhutanese government, of course, is very famous for trying to set up a national happiness index. The French government have looked very hard at, at, at trying to do something similar. There have been studies done in London. Um, I, there, are, there are governments around the world who are looking at this in various half-hearted, less half-hearted ways. Um, the OECD is coming out with a whole new series of measures which, which cover everything from housing to income to jobs to civic engagement, health which are internationally comparable. Uh, so, I mean, there, I think there are plenty. I mean, there's, there's also, and I can give you a list of them, you know, uh, 20 or 30 different alternative measures of economic development, or social development, I should say, other than GDP and economic growth, which you could measure about well-being. I mean, one very simple thing you can do, which has been done regularly in Norway, is simply to go and ask people how satisfied they are with life and how much they feel optimistic or pessimistic about the future. A very simple way of measuring, tracking every year whether or not people are feeling better or feeling more optimistic. I mean, the very simple measures you can take. It doesn't have to be uh, very, very complicated. I come back to my main point, though. It's, it's what are you trying to achieve? You have to answer that question before you can work out what do you want to measure. Julian Martin. Yeah, I, I, I want to come in around that. The, there was a couple of people in the panel last week in some of the submission papers that were quite critical of the discourse around the economy in the media and in politics, where we're focusing in on things like growth 
and not inclusive growth and not the things that you've been talking about, uh, Mr Maxton, around happiness, satisfaction, um, social well-being. How do we, I mean, every time a report comes out on the Scottish economy, and we're going to be putting a report together ourselves, and our, next, our next investigation will be into the performance of the Scottish economy. What do you think we, in our next uh, investigation, should be focusing on which doesn't feed into the discourse, which is very limiting and sometimes very depressing. Yeah, I, exactly. And that's why I said at the beginning, I think you've got an opportunity here. The, the Club of Rome's view on the world stems from a book which was published in 1972 called The Limits to Growth. And it was the Club of Rome started by a Scotsman and an Italian. And basically it said, if we carry on increasing our impact on the planet, as we were doing in the 1970s, we would hit a crisis around, the, around 2030. Now, we would argue that crisis is already underway. But we, we focus today on two major areas, social problems and environmental problems. And both of those all stem from the same basic cause, which is our economic system. Our economic system increases inequality. It doesn't count the value of nature or the planet. Uh, it, it increases unemployment. It increases poverty. So the economic system is the cause of all our problems. Now, if you're going to go away and think about a new statistical system or a new economic system, then that's where to begin. How do we change the economic system and how do we change the views of the people so that they understand it's not just about economic growth, it's not just about jobs, it's about a much broader level of social welfare and well-being that we're trying to achieve, in, particularly in the rich world. So this is an opportunity for Scotland to, to, to take a different path to realise that the economic system is the, the main cause of your problems. All the social and environmental problems we have are because of the current economic system. I could talk about it all day if we wanted to, but, but basically that, that's the root cause of all our problems. And it, now if you think about the, the, what you measure, you can think about what you value and then you can change the system and change the way people view their economy. I mean, what's the economy for? It's not about growth. As one famous economist said, the only thing that wants to grow forever is a cancer cell. I'm happy to hear other people's views as well about around the discourse around um, so the you, economy. You very rarely get the opportunity to, to start from scratch. So even with the new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament, there is a legacy from them not being devolved. There is a legacy in terms of the education of the citizens and the journalists and the culture that we have around uh, the economy and what people value, whether that's correct or not. So I'm not sure if I'd be all the way over to where Graham is as, as much as I actually agree with a lot of what Graham says and that there are things that we will continue to need to measure and produce and publish. Um, I think the key point, though, is making sure that we're not focusing on one thing. So the idea that GDP is the be-all and end-all has been totally really disproven over the last 10 years in a way. You know, we've had a growth back to sub-average, but um, sorry, growth in GDP um, back to sub-average levels for a lot of the last 10 years. But life chances, quality of life, pay rates, tax revenue per head, all of these things are not going with it. Um, and quality of work underneath that. So I think not having one measure firstly, secondly, measuring the things that you do value, whether they feed into a GDP, whether they feed into a quality of life measure or a well-being measure. So employment rates are interesting, but getting underneath that, what's the quality of work? What's uh, the security of work? How volatile is that work? Um, I think getting into that territory is, is a really interesting place for your next inquiry, uh, which in essence is describing what we value as Scotland's economic model. Um, what is the economic model we wish to achieve in Scotland? What are its constituent parts and can we begin to measure them? Um, some of that is possible now. So that volatility of work or um, you know, the, the level of um, uh, zero hours contracts, we get snapshot measures. There's data right there that I would be itching to look at that would tell us in a much more uh, flavorful way what's happening in the labor market right now but we don't have um, the capacity to look at it. So, so it's a really good example there in terms of quality of work. <clears throat> Data exists right down to Scotland level underneath that, but we don't have the capacity at IPPR or elsewhere to be looking at that and to let you know um, and to develop solutions. To so really, one of the things we should really be looking at is what's actually happening in people's homes, 
what's actually happening in terms of the, the household itself. Yeah, and there's perception measures of that that Graeme talked about that are really valuable, um, and there are harder measures. Um, that isn't a better. I'm not saying harder is better, but um, there are harder measures around pay rates, around um, you know family experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that um, yes, bring that together, and you get a much better picture of the individual or the group or the neighbourhood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, experience of our economy. Yeah, there's two points I would like to make. I think I think. To some extent, you're a victim of your own purpose targets. Your purpose targets are to raise GDP growth to the UK level and to match GDP growth the same, the same rate as small European countries. Uh, and then there's a productivity target, and we all know the dangers of productivity. So as long as, as your objectives are set as broadly and as basically as that, then there will be the discourse around growth. Yeah. And that will be it. There are four eyes there, innovation, inclusive growth. Where the policies directly relating to that, where are the targets relating to that, this is what we're going to achieve, we're going to have 5% more IEDs, you know, innovative internalised enterprises next year than we had this year. Then you begin a narrative of success and positive and progress. As long as we're stuck with the purpose targets, then this, this discourse in the papers will just continue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. This discourse, discourse starts with communication. Um, quite often, if the discourse is bad in the media, it's just because... You, know, you can talk about GDP because it's quite a simple number and people kind of think they know what it means and you can just quote a single number, it makes a good headline. If you want to have a, a broader, more uh, comprehensive uh, set of well-being factors, it takes time and effort to explain that. But it's time and effort worth putting in. Andy had a follow-up on this. Yes, um I mean, I agree that GDP is disproven, has been for decades, I think. You described it as disproven, Russell. So I suppose my question is, why does the Scottish Government and the UK Government still use it? And should we be abandoning it as a key purpose target, as Gil describes it? So in terms of disproven, I mean, certainly for the last 10 years, um, GDP has not been linked to those things that it used to be linked to in the government's minds. So if we've got GDP growth, we'd get employment rate. That has linked. Um, but we'd get tax revenue in, we'd get quality of life, happiness, etc. We'd be popular to bring it down to um, the electoral, um, I suppose, arithmetic in this. That hasn't happened. So for the last 10 years, I'm not saying it's disproven beyond that. It may return. Who knows? Um, why do we keep using it? I think it's very difficult to get um, other measures that, uh, you know, if you shift from GDP, there's a real risk that as a government or a parliament, it looks like you're just trying to cook the books. And what you need in order to avoid that accusation is a whole heap of education to show that, no, what we're actually doing is measuring something much more important to you. And then there's a little bit of faith, I, I would argue, um, you know, this is maybe speaking more to Graham's view, that um, there's an opportunity for Scotland to try something different. Um, to push for different measures and different headline measures that uh, you set yourself as a test. Um, going with that and seeing if the electorate or more generally public opinion is ready. Um, but it's a big risk and it probably takes uh, consensus across parties rather than one party going for it alone. There are two reasons that we still think that GDP is a good measure. First of all, uh, after the Second World War, between, between 1945 and and the late 70s, it was a good general measure because as GDP increased, the general well-being of the population of the developed world increased in parallel. They moved, moved together. Um, it was a very different political system. There was a much greater welfare state at that point, uh, which, which was one of the buffers. So I think one of the reasons is we've got into our heads that post-war era, era where GDP was a good measure of, of, of social progress. But if you look since then, I mean, happiness indexes have stayed pretty much flat. Uh, inequality has gone up, unemployment's gone up, and it's become much less a good measure. The second reason is that we have been, we've been persuaded by a group of economists uh, if you look for the Mont Pelerin Society, a group, of, a group of economists that started at the Chicago School, who persuaded us systematically uh, from the 1970s onwards that, that we need to do something very simple for economic progress. We need to have small government, we need to have open markets, uh, we, we need to have uh, less regulation. 
all of those have become common thinking. We believe all of those things, even although we have a system which benefits the rich more than anybody else. Even though that between 1990 and 2010, GDP in the, in the rich world, in the OECD, was the fastest level in human history, and yet unemployment went up, and yet inequality went up. So we've got this, this wrong picture in our heads, which we've had for the last 30 years. And I mean, it's very difficult once you have that system of beliefs to, to change that. And that's where the, where, the, where the problem really lies. We've become used to something which is fundamentally factually incorrect. Yeah, it's <clears throat> you're asking an interesting question. Uh, um, we need GDP growth because of the bond markets fundamentally. Who's going to buy your bonds if you, if you don't know your GDP growth? Now, as long as the capitalist system stays in place, much as you may disagree with it, or I disagree with it, that has to be the way, because otherwise you're not going to get, sell your bonds. But let's put it in context. It's one measurement. There are far more interesting aspects that the Scottish Government could look at, particularly around productivity. Productivity fascinates me. I watched the, 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 the session the other day when um, John McLaren des described it as peeling an onion. It is the great intangible. And when you peel that onion back, you do get to the magic. And the magic always comes back to people, motivated people at work. If people are happy at work, they will produce more. It's not just a case of throwing less money and, and creating efficiencies. And with the automation that's coming down the line, we have an opportunity to put a line in the sand about what productivity means in Scotland as opposed to what it means elsewhere. Because I suspect our archetype is, I certainly ran my business in, in London, with a higher degree of investment in people than any other agency in my business. Because I reckoned I'd lose less people and I'd have a happier workforce. Now, that flies in the face of common views on productivity, but it worked. So I think productivity on the purpose target is something that needs to be drilled down before we get caught up in this idea of, well, you know, and this is how it'll come at you. Oh, productivity, that just means we, 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 we pay the living wage in McDonald's, well, the automation's gonna come in quicker. That's the answer you're going to get. Right? Well, I would argue you've got happier workforce in McDonald's, and there are things in place like bonus targets. If we exceed level X, then the staff participate in Y, and the government puts incentives in place for staff to do that. The businesses encourage them to, to reward staff in that way. Then you've got a different model, because London will only ever go down that route of hardcore productivity. And I don't think that's the Scottish way. And then Graham Maxton. Um, remember that Scotland's not the only uh, country that's, that's wrestling with this problem. Was it last year that Ireland saw its GDP grow by something like 26%, essentially because a bunch of multinational companies bought a, a bunch of multinational companies overseas? So the GDP figure just didn't reflect anything to do with the, the Irish economy. They are now having to have this, have a, this exact conversation of what, they, what else to do. Um, you, you can argue the, the limits of any, any single economic measure and you can even try and game them if you want, which is, just goes back to why you need to have a broad suite of them. You can't rely on a single number. I, I just want to come back on this issue of productivity because Gil's right, it's been really, really important. There are basically two sources of economic growth. One is productivity improvements, and the other is population growth. Now, in the rich world, both of those are tending to zero. And no matter how much money you spend, no matter what you do, Productivity will not increase. If you look from the 1960s to today, productivity, GDP growth per head has been trending down every year throughout the rich world. It's gone down particularly fast in places like Japan, but it's now coming down in Europe, and it will come down particularly in the US. Now, why is that happening? Because the economic system is going into a fourth stage. The first stage of the economic development was the Industrial Revolution. Now, if you, if you try and improve productivity by taking people off the farms and putting them into factories, you can boost productivity dramatically. The next stage was to put them into the service sector. Now, you can improve productivity by putting people in offices, but the this opportunity for improved productivity declines. Now we're moving into the next stage, which is, this, which is the care sector, where everything that will be automated or can be automated will be automated, and the jobs that are going to be left are those that are, are in uh, services and care where it's very, very difficult to improve productivity. You can't cut hair faster than, than, than somebody else. You can't look after somebody who's elderly faster. You can't do it more, improve productivity. You can't play a Beethoven symphony faster. And so you get to an economic situation where there will be no economic growth. 
If you have a stable population, you cannot improve productivity. And that's where we're heading to. And that's why Japan has had no growth for 20 years. And that's why the European Union's growth rate is falling progressively. You're going to hit a stage where for the next 30 years, you will not be have, able to have any productivity improvement, which means that you cannot have any economic growth. And that's why you need a different economic system and a different perspective. OK, thanks for that. Putting aside the question of what we do measure, and that is fundamentally important in this inquiry about economic data, um, Commonwealth, you produce uh, the suggestion that, for example, Estonia is doing very well just on kind of data capture, data sharing, um, and so presumably leading to more intelligent decisions. I don't know, maybe you could reflect on that. Um, and Gil, you say in a press release this morning that uh, Reform Scotland calls for more reliable data to reduce risk of bad policy decisions. I wonder if you could give us an example, one or two examples of what you regard as bad policy decisions. Um, yeah, Estonia is quite famous for having a very developed digital sector, very de developed IT sector. Um, so one of the limits that we've been finding uh, over the course of these discussions is if you're relying on survey data for your statistics, especially at the, the subsample level, um, it, it becomes prohibitively expensive to to, to, to get your sample sizes high enough to, to make decent policy decisions based on them. Whereas if you're looking more at, the, at just gathering the, the, the data directly um, through administrative data, just gathering people's income and tax data, for instance, directly um, to near census level resolution, then um, if the infrastructure is there to do that automatically, then quite often the work's already done for you. So what, what, what you're saying in Estonia, they have a very good system of capturing administrative data. Is that the essence of your Essent point? Essentially, yeah. It might not, you know, you, I don't think you would be able to take a system from any one country and just simply transplant it into Scotland. Um, but you can certainly learn the lessons from them. Our point on centralisation. We, we think there should be more regional responsibility for likes of uh, business rates and so on. Um, more devolved powers to local government. And we think that the data they have is insufficiently used. And if we used it more, they only control 14% of the spend. The data is very good that um, decisions might be reversed in their favour. So that's where reform are coming with that one. No, I can understand that. That's the substantive part of your written evidence. But I'm just wondering, you talk in the, in the headline of your press release to reduce risk of bad policy decisions. Do you think that's just a risk in the abstract or do you have concrete examples? No, I... I okay. Defer to Jeff Maudsley on that. Okay. Um, just the bad policy decisions, I'm not taking up um, the invitation um, potentially within Scotland, but um, I think you can look at the UK wide, including Scotland, um, culture around decision making, public policy making, and compare that to some other countries. So New Zealand is often cited as a very, very long term uh, view in terms of its public finances. Every single um, policy decision has a 25, 30 year um, view in terms of its impacts on public finances for good and for bad. And what that's got you to, um, and I'm quite intrigued by this, albeit they've just had an election, so we'll see where they end up government-wise in the future. But you've had a quite centre-right, right-wing government investing in welfare, because albeit maybe with a discredited model, maybe not in terms of neoliberalism, um, they were investing early because over the long term it saves money. So there's a really good example of where, not blaming a particular political party, but our culture is much shorter term in terms of our um, spending decisions. They've got to a much longer term uh, horizon, which seems to be, in my view, leading to better decision making. Uh, we would need much better data and, again, analysis of that data and, again, options development using that data to get to their position. Thank you. And a uh, follow-up from Dean Lockhart. Uh, yes, there's a question about strategic alignment, which cuts across some of the issues you, you've discussed. Um, the Scottish Government spends over £2 billion a year on skills and enterprise uh, development. And a new, as you, as you know, a new uh, strategic board has been established to uh, align the activities of the enterprise and skills agencies, which I think is, is a good thing. So, so a couple of questions on this. What... Um, to achieve that alignment, what's the best data to use to have consistency across those agencies? Because in my mind, some of the objectives of the four eyes are very difficult to measure. For example, inclusive growth, I think, is quite difficult to measure. Innovation is quite difficult to measure. So I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on 
how do we measure inclusive growth? Um, how do we measure innovation in terms of what policies will encourage this? And then a separate or supplemental question might be, do we need a new set of KPIs, detailed KPIs, to track the four eyes and, and, and to measure uh, what policies might be effective and measure progress against the four eyes? Me, I agree that there is a necessary alignment of the data needs across the enterprise and skills bodies. I think this is a really good opportunity to get there. There's a balance again, a bit like with the previous question around independent statistics um, agencies, in that there are some data required to ensure that you're running a system correctly and um, in, a, in essence performance data um, that you will absolutely not need to keep. Um, the interesting, uh, I suppose, opportunity from this is around what you allude to around different ways of measuring the outcomes, if you like, of the spend of that two billion plus uh, investment. So what type of things? I think um, I haven't quite given up the ghost on productivity, but maybe I'm behind the, the curve on that. But um, I think looking at pay rates, I think looking at career progression is a really, really important precursor if you're trying to tackle in work poverty, um, if you're trying to look at the quality of work. Um, I think it's a really important measure and a really important measure for our skill system. I think productivity likewise. Um, and yes, do we need uh, KPIs around the four I's? Um, yes, I think is the, the short answer to that. Um, a much longer answer would be around, you know, how can you measure innovation? How can you measure some of these uh, inclusive growth, for example? A very, very short, uh, small thing on that is that I know JR, uh, sorry, Joseph Rantree Foundation are developing a diagnostic tool around inclusive growth. And I think likewise within government, there's moves um, to develop a tool that allows you to tell, uh, and no doubt as part of that, allows you to define uh, what inclusive growth is. So it might be useful for you to Okay. to contact both. Yeah, just to take up on that point on the inclusive growth, I think one of the previous um, members of the previous panel had uh, suggested that there isn't really a good definition of what inclusive growth actually means. It does feel a little bit like one of these political phrases that can be pulled either way depending on how you want it to go. Um, but we can also say if we, if we take on Graham's point that the growth is not going to come because we are hitting the limits of that economic model, then inclusive growth really just means inequality. Um, so perhaps we need to reflect on what the four eyes actually will mean and maybe they need, maybe they need adjusting. Mm. That's maybe another conversation to be had. Can, just picking up on, on Craig's point there, I mean, there are ways of measuring inequality, I and mean, the two most famous ways are the Gini coefficient and the Palmer index, which measures the top 10% versus the bottom 40% in terms of wealth distribution. But, but just going back to this inclusive growth, I mean, to some extent, that's an oxymoron. I mean, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, I mean, is the best-selling economics book that nobody's actually read because it's so complicated. But, but it explains, the basic message is, economic growth increases inequality. That's what it does. It moves the wealth from the poor to the rich. It increases the, 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 the gap between rich and poor because those with the wealth at the beginning are able to invest it and therefore get the returns from it. And the, the, the entire system moves. It's another fake belief that we've got that, that inequality is reduced with economic growth. Economic growth increases inequality. If you look at the Gini coefficient of the rich world over the last 200 years, from 1820 to 2000, the OECD numbers, the, the, the inequality has gone up. Despite all this economic growth, all the industrialization, inequality has gone up. And if you look at the gap between the rich world and the poor world from 1820 to 2000, it's three times bigger today than it was in 1820. So, so economic growth is not a source of greater equality. If you want to have inclusive progress, you have to do something different. Yeah, I'll just pick, on, <clears throat> pick up on the innovation point, if that's okay, Dean. Um, R&D investment clearly is, is mm. central to that. Um, and it's quite interesting looking at the um, national indicators on that, where I think it's, it, it, there's a sort of graph and it looks very successful, but and it suggests that spend in the EU on R&D, on, on generally in the EU, is 1.8%. Yeah, 
but Germany's spending three, Denmark's spending three, and Austria's spending three, and the CBI recommendation is that, is that the UK should spend three. The UK only spends 1.8. So R&D spend, to me, on innovation is, is, is the central measurement there, and I don't think we spend enough. Can I just very quickly come back in on inclusive growth? Um, so I think whilst the overall picture is as Graham describes, and that across the globe we've we've improved and then regressed back to 200 years ago levels of inequality, the more hopeful, optimistic part of me points to, in history, that hasn't always been the case. And equally, in some countries, you've got far uh, lower levels of inequality than others. So I think where we are, um, as an organisation where I am, is thinking through what economic model would drive equality rather than inequality. Now, that may or may not be a capitalist one, and I, I can hear... Craig and, and Graham's view on that. For us, we're a little bit more dispassionate as to what um, principles sit underneath it. It's much more the outcome. Um, and again, there are countries that are closer to this than others. We, at the UK level, have been closer to this than we are now in the past. So for us, through we've got a Commission on Economic Justice, um, which is looking afresh at the economic model across the UK. We'll be looking at Scotland as part of that. Um, and we'll see what comes out of that. But we haven't quite given up entirely um, on uh, inclusive growth or uh, you know, improving economic prospects for the country. I, I, I keep being portrayed as an anti-capitalist here. I'm not. I'm not anti-capitalist. I'm not anti-market at all. There are countries that have achieved high levels of growth and high levels of equality. Japan, particularly. Sweden. Austria, where I used to live. And they do it because they have a balance between the welfare state and business. It's not that they're totally one and totally the other. They simply, it's an observation. They are able to achieve a balance because they set their political priorities to achieve that balance. They're not just going for the open market growth-oriented objectives. They're going for, for a broader range of measures. The Japanese in particular have been very clever at this. The Austrians too. And those are the countries to look to if you want to be, if you want to reduce inequality. And if you look at inequality in the last 30 years, it has not increased in these countries. And in France, it's gone down for the same reasons. It's about inclusive policies and, and, and a, a balancing welfare state. Thank you. Okay. And Ash Denham, I think, had a question that related to this I did. area I, as well. I was going to ask about the four eyes, but I think Dean has covered that one off. Um, I should also probably declare an interest. I used to work for Commonweal. Um, so I'll just come back to something that, Russell, um, you raised earlier. So you said that we potentially aren't lacking data, we're lacking analysis of the data that we actually have. And, and that did come up on um, the panel last week. Um, so I was wondering if the panel could maybe reflect on, ideally, what that might look like. So, I mean, would that be an independent stats agency? Would it be, you know, more Scottish specific think tanks, perhaps, or maybe just um, academics spending more time, you know, in the Scottish universities looking at the data we have? Shall I kick off? Um, I think, it, so again, the independent, just in my view, the independent statistics authority may or may not be useful, but it won't be useful in this territory. Right. So if we're looking for independent analysis and independent scrutiny and equally independent um, options development, that is not usually, anyway, the role of a statistics authority. What I had in mind in that is around more your think tanks, in, in, in essence, your ecosystem around policy making. So that could be journalism, that could be um, civil society, that could be stakeholders, that could be think tanks, that could certainly be academia. Um, do we need more think tanks? I think the more the merrier, speaking as a think tank. Um, we're two years into our uh, existence in Scotland, um, and we've, we've heard you know, Reform, Fraser Valander, and a few others, Commonweal included, that have developed over a similar period of time, or redeveloped. And I think more um, the merrier on that. I think what's lacking is around funding, and that's always a, a tricky thing. Yep. Um, so in the rest of the UK and in other countries of a larger scale, Private sector funding comes in, trust and foundations come in to help fund that independent activity. In smaller countries, often they have to provide public funding at arm's length. Um, now I wouldn't be as bold to suggest that that would be what we would want, because it's very self-interested of me to do so. But certainly looking at the funding that comes through the Scottish budget for research purposes, and whether we can bring that, or at least a part of that, into a nearer term focus, and, and really align it with the priorities of the parliament or the government, I think would be a really interesting 
idea. So more than merry in terms of organisations, but it's actually probably funding streams that are um, the key to this. Um, again, the question kind of speaks to what kind of statistics agency you would have if you're having a very centralised body producing the bulk of the stats, then you will need outside scrutiny on that. If you're providing a, if the, the, the SSA is a, an overseer of a decentralised network, then it will almost be performing that analytical role to, to gather that data and combine it and then communicate it. But yes, you will then need the scrutiny, scrutiny on top of that again. So uh, as, as Russell said, I completely agree with everything there. You can also speak to the, the, the communication side. How do you present that data so that other organisations can reach it and, and, and look at it? Someone who is a professional statistician will be looking for one level of de depth to the data, a politician looking to form a policy at a different depth, a member of the public just wanting to know what's going on will need a, another, another degree of depth again. Uh, and you need to be able to speak to, to all, all, all of these people. So you do need to break down sometimes very complicated statistics into a way that is easily understood for the layperson. Um, there are good examples of this. The, the late Hans Rosling uh, produced um, a, a website called Gapminder, which looks at overall de global demographic data, but it does it in a really user-friendly way. You can go in, you can say, right, I want to see countries by geographical size and population density over time, and you just plug away at the graph and, it, and it's there, it shows you. So a really user-friendly front end to uh, the, the data portal that still then provides you, if you want to download the raw data and manipulate it yourself, mm -hmm. you can do that. Um, that, that would be very valuable. Um, I think other, other places like Eurostat, uh, well, not quite as user-friendly as, as Gapminder does provide that sort of level of, of accessibility. So that's, that's maybe, maybe, maybe lessons to be learned there. Yeah, I, I think Russell's and Craig have made good points. The only uh, point I'd make on that specifically is, is I think you've got an excellent potential body in, in uh, the FAI and Fraser Islander. I think it could be beefed up to be a Scottish FS, F, IFS looking at regional problems and addressing them, solutions. Um, you touched on academia, and I'm going to stretch data to a different, slightly different area. Um, it's interesting when you look at um, Palo Alto and, and, and California and, and how innovation is, is exemplary there. It's because they have universities like Stanford and Caltech sitting there and business comes straight in on the back because the talent there and the innovation is doing and they're sharing data. They're sharing what they're doing. The same happens in Cambridge. Cambridge could be a, a city of two million people because it's the head of biotech. AstraZeneca moved there. Why? Because that's where the data, I, I use the word data, but that's where the information is coming from. I'm not sure we have that to the degree we should here. Um, but it's essential for growth that we tie up what's happening in universities with the private sector and with the government. Um, there was a suggestion on, on the panel last um, week that the reason that academics in Scotland didn't spend um, as much time looking at the, the Scottish data was that it wasn't good for their careers. I don't know if anybody would comment on that. No, maybe I should declare an interest in it. My wife is an academic, but um, but um, I wouldn't know um, too closely whether that's the case in terms of the incentives and disincentives within the system. I do know that we, I think it's certainly into the hundreds of millions of pounds put out the door through the SFC for academic research. Um, so that's Scottish money rather than the Research Council's money that's across UK. Yeah. And I think it is worth looking at whether we would like to take any different priorities to the UK-wide priorities with that funding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, bringing it nearer term, bringing it into some of the, the public policy issues that you here and other colleagues in here are wrestling with. I think could be quite an interesting thing for academics to do or for organisations uh, that you've heard here today too. Could anyone on their career prospects? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, just to clarify, I think it was because it, it, um, it's not a, nas you know, a national set of data mm. and that obviously yeah. if you're publishing, you know, um, UK-wide, you know, has, is a bit more interesting in that, in that way. So I'm just wondering if Scotland's losing out, you know, because of that. I think we could probably agree we are. Anyone wish to, uh, Craig? Just to, so, yeah. working for a think tank, I'm making quite a good career out of analysing data. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't speak for academia, I'm afraid. I, 
Nisa, it, it I mean, for example, a good friend of mine is the director at Nisa, and he spends his time rainmaking. And he brings money. They fund largely from the private sector, in fact, almost exclusively from the private sector. But because of the kind of work they are doing on governmental spend and analysis like the IFS, the private sector is very interested in that because it's superb quality data. Again, we don't have that up here. We don't attract the private funding because we're not producing the degree of work that would attract them yet. Is, is that partly to do with the, the size of Scotland in terms of population as compared to, for example, England? Well, I, I think there's a degree to which that's true. But when you look at the economic challenges ahead of Scotland, but the economic advantages, of, particularly in the area of someone like finance, I don't see why we can't be enticing investment from private companies across the world into an analysis of the Scottish financial uh, opportunities that exist and analysis. And I think some of it is down to scale. scale. Um, some of it. And other countries of a similar scale, again, have, if you, it's not quite an accurate term, but um, have seen market failure in this and therefore stepped in. Um, but it's not just that. I think there's a cultural issue here too in, in terms of catching up with the powers that are already devolved and may well come in the future to this parliament. Um, I don't think the culture is quite caught up with that. So often UK-wide organisations with the resources to do this type of thing are much more focused on UK-wide uh, issues than Scotland-only ones. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if each of our guests might wish to sum up what they've taken from today's session as the, the key point that they, they would like to make to the committee. I mean, it's where I started, I suppose, um, and in a way, the, the final question um, it leads on from that, in the sense that we absolutely need to get a Rolls-Royce or whatever term you wish to use level of collection of data. We absolutely need to make sure we can share that data and link that data together. We need to be collecting the right things around our priorities and at the right level around Scotland, regional or more local than that. But unless we have people that can analyse that data and use it to work up solutions for you, um, we'll be spending a lot of money, or somebody will be, um, without the impact that we can necessarily get. So all of those issues are real, but I think, again, I'd emphasise the analysis of data and the development of solutions on the back of that analysis is a key issue for us around data. Yeah. And just to say that Scotland does have a, a great opportunity here to, to go above and beyond what, what is already being done. I think we've, over the course of this inquiry, I think the, a lot of the flaws have been identified and quite a few of solutions have been offered. Um, so it'll be very interesting to just track how, how things progress from here as we, as we move forward. Um, Scotland has a very high reputation around the world in a number of areas already for policy development climate, energy, social inclusiveness. And, you know, I think Scotland has an opportunity uh, to remain at the heart of, of, of a European Union in many ways, which is much more thinks along the same lines as Scotland on these issues. And I think you have an interesting opportunity here when you're thinking about collecting data and what you measure. To, to set a standard, to, to, to be the, 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 the standard bearer for inclusive social development. But what I would say, again, what I said before is, why? Ask your question, the question why before you ask the question what. Why do you want to measure it? What are you trying to achieve? And then ask what and how. And I'd suggest that we look through the other end of the telescope um, we have purpose targets and we have an economic strategy with our four eyes. Um, the data must serve those objectives, but those data, those objectives are not quantifiable to a sufficient level. Once they were quantifiable, then go and search for that data, analyse that data wherever you may find it in the best sources, um, rather than let the data dictate where we go, because it won't, ultimately. All the data will enable people to do is take positions and then progress will not take place. All right, well, thank you very much to all of our guests today. Thank you very much. I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move to private session.